That would be perfect. Uh, good morning. It is 9.47 in the morning, and I'd like to call this meeting to order and ask that Ms. Cruteau please call the poll. Here. Hi. Here. 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 Thank you. Quorum is established. And before we dive right into item number 14, I just would like to remind everyone in the audience who is specifically here for CPD credit to please sign in and sign out with Ms. McCochran. And can you please wave? Yes, that is your point person for CPD today. And again, just remember to sign in and sign out. Thank you. Agenda item number 14 is the Behavioral Health Workforce Challenges. And I welcome Dr. Sergio Aguilar Gaxiola, who is a professor of clinical internal medicine, director of the Center for Reducing Health Disparities, and director of the Community Engagement Program of the CTSC. UC Davis School of Medicine, absolutely. Please have a seat. Thank you so much for coming and we're looking forward to your presentation. You need to turn on your microphone. Is there a green dot? Oh, there, there yep. we go. And then just pull the microphone towards you a little yeah, bit. Thank you. Thank well, you so good much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. And thank you, Antoinette, because uh, you know the many emails that, that we exchange and uh, Yes, uh, I would like to uh, present, uh, you know, to share with you some thoughts related to the behavioral health uh, workforce challenges and some recommendations as well. And if uh, you can. Uh, sure. Just, just How about it. that? Yep. Better? Okay. Yes. Yeah. And because of COVID, you know, my eyesight is not as good. Uh, so uh, that's why I'm having my computer right here. And I understand that uh, someone is gonna change the slides. Unfortunately, due to the technical difficulties in the room, we've just learned that um, we won't be able to use the projector. Yeah, okay. Do you have co a copy of the slides? So how about if we, we just do. get started and, and I walk, uh, walk you through, okay? All right. Uh, so I'm hoping to cover uh, several topics today. Uh, uh, for example, who constitutes the behavioral health uh, workforce? Uh, also, uh, the California behavioral health workforce challenges, uh, the workforce uh, in uh, behavioral health occupations, uh, also, some of the distribution of the behavioral health uh, workforce uh, 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 by region, by age, and racial and ethnic distribution as well. Also to talk a little bit about the supply and demand uh, for some of the behavioral health uh, uh, providers. And, and uh, talk a little bit about the workforce pipeline as well. And to finish with some conclusions and recommendations. Uh, if, if you go to the next slide, shot of uh, the California Future Health Workforce Commission. May I ask of you?
40 technical advisory committee members, and I'm, I was a part of the technical advisory committee as well, feeding uh, 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 information to the commissioners and the three subcommittees. And what I want to just share with you is that uh, the report, uh, which I encourage you to look up, and I'm so pleased that uh, <laughs> you, you know about it, because it, it, it uh, developed uh, 27 recommendations based on a lot of input and a st a stakeholder feedback. And, and, and also the commissioners prioritize 10 recommendations based on urgency and potential for impact. And uh, each of the 27 recommendations comes uh, with a specific proposal on how to implement those recommendations. Uh, so uh, in some, uh, there were uh, 115, about 115 individuals uh, from 80 organizations that generated uh, solutions. I co-chaired this with my uh, colleague and friend, Liz uh, Gibbonet, and we are both uh, now serving in the board of directors of the California Healthcare Foundation, which was one of the funders of uh, uh, this commission. So key question, who constitutes the behavioral health workforce? And I have a list of providers there, and I'm gonna go through it. You know, the psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, licensed clinical social workers, licensed professional counselors, marriage and family therapists, and psychiatric nurse practitioners, psychiatric uh, nurse specialists, psychiatric technicians, substance use disorder counselors, and peer providers. But let me tell you, the need is such, especially now after COVID, that uh, the state has to be extremely, uh, you know, resourceful on how to meet uh, those needs. So I can tell you that uh, the Department of Healthcare Services has been funding for a good chunk of uh, the pandemia, uh, a crisis counselor program that was uh, funded originally by FEMA, but uh, now the state is paying for it, which is uh, uh, hiring uh, 550 promotoras or community health workers to do crisis counseling work. They are not crisis counselors themselves, but this is a, this is a way of dealing with the, uh, uh, you know, the urgent things that the population is, is experiencing. Uh, I have another very busy slide that uh, kind of gives you uh, the credentials, qualifications, and customer uh, customary practice, and then some specific areas by uh, the professions that I just mentioned. You know, for example, and I highlight uh, psychologists. My PhD is in clinical community psychology, and I'm not practicing right now because I'm totally devoted to uh, research. But, uh, you know, I was trained on what is uh, highlighted there, like uh, psychological testing, uh, treatment planning, and therapy as well. And that's what uh, clinical psychologists uh, are, uh, uh, you know, trained. And that's their area, primary area of, of their expertise. But you can see there uh, the various uh, specific uh, areas of competence that the, 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 the different uh, mental health professions have. And, and then the next slide uh, is uh, kind of a, a summary of some of the licensed professions and also certified professions and unlicensed professions. And uh, if you think about a pyramid, the base of that pyramid is unlicensed occupations. You know, this is the greatest majority of the people that is available to provide some kind of, of uh, 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 mental health uh, help. Um, and, and then the licensed professions are at the tip of the pyramid. You know, uh, there are not too many that are, uh, uh, that, uh, are available. The workforce challenges, uh, and I list uh, some of them here, like there is a significant shortage of behavioral health providers, uh, and I'll uh, share with you a little bit more information about that. Also, uh, one very important point is that uh, the workforce 
uh, uh, is uh, poorly distributed across the state. I will illustrate that point as well. Also, uh, uh, the, the, you know, disparities on, on by race and ethnicity, for example, and linguistically, uh, li uh, language as well, uh, you know, with uh, the existing, existing workforce. I'll illustrate that also. And uh, also, uh, the forecast is uh, 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 it's anticipated that there will be an insufficient numbers of behavioral health professionals that will enter the workforce to replace those who uh, are retiring or will retire within the next five years, certainly within the next uh, 10 years. And uh, one thing that is important to recognize is that many behavioral health professionals are at or near uh, retirement. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that, uh, and this is related to why behavioral health workforce development matters. Uh, well, one thing that we are experiencing right now, and I'm in the field, you know, we are doing a lot of on the ground uh, work, you know, uh, using mobile units and going to where people are. And the needs are tremendous. I can tell you, you know, we are doing testing vaccinations, but something that emerges are uh, mental health needs, you know, in these populations. Uh, so the demand for behavioral health services grew during the 2000s and certainly it accelerated during the, the pandemic. Uh, many people have a net need uh, for behavioral health services. I cannot tell you uh, with uh, frequency that I heard about uh, suiciding kids, you know, in youth. Uh, we have done work with a lot of counties and, you know, the report from uh, some counties is the significant increase in suicides. I know friends, actually, whose uh, adolescent kid, you know, has been three times hospitalized. And uh, this time outside of the state, because the two uh, previous hospitalizations in the state uh, didn't work out well. Uh, so just to emphasize the incredible uh, need that we have right now, especially uh, for uh, children in youth. Uh, and there are many good reasons for that. And the, the other thing is uh, uh, there are, uh, once again, racial and ethnic and socioeconomic differences in the net need for behavioral health uh, uh, services. I have a couple of slides about the estimated number of mental health professionals uh, uh, back to 2020. This comes from the Almanac on mental health in California from the California Healthcare Foundation. And uh, uh, what you see there is that uh, the majority of the mental health professionals are marriage and family therapists, then clinical social workers, then psychologists that uh, back to 2020, it was about uh, 17,500. Uh, and all the way down to psychiatric te technicians, psychiatrists, which uh, up, uh, back to uh, 2020, uh, 4,660 and then uh, professional clinical counselors. Uh, in total, uh, there are like 99,000, there were 99,000 behavioral health providers uh, in, in 2020. And the next slide uh, is uh, uh, basically the same numbers, very similar numbers, but by percentages. And uh, as you can see, uh, psychologists, uh, clinical psychologists and uh, counseling psychologists uh, uh, make up about 18% of the behavioral health professionals in California back to 2020 again. Uh, the other thing that I want to uh, emphasize is the uneven distribution of the behavioral health providers uh, in the different regions in California. Uh, one slide that you have there is to contrast how, for, for example, and the metric that is widely used is the number of professionals per 100,000 uh, uh, population. And uh, uh, what I illustrate this in the case of psychiatrists uh, is that there is a, a very uneven distribution by those who are concentrated in the greater Bay Area compared uh, to those in the inland empire 
in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and, and then the next slide, I highlight, you know, licensed, licensed psychologists and making the same point, you know, that there is a tremendous uh, uh, uneven distribution of these professions, uh, of this particular profession uh, in those concentrated, for example, in the in greater Bay Area versus the Inland Empire and the San Joaquin Valley. You know, there's a tremendous need of uh, clinical psychologists and other behavioral health professionals in, in these areas. Uh, and then I have a slide. Uh, uh, so if, if you are interested about uh, what the regions, uh, uh, which are the counties that are included in those specific regions, so you have a, a better sense of, of that. The other thing is uh, the age distribu distribution, I, as I already mentioned, that uh, there are three behavioral health professionals, professions over 20% of the workforce that is uh, 60 years or, old or older, like in my case. Uh, and those are psychiatrists, clinical and counseling psychologists, and marriage and family therapists. And I can tell you that the pandemia has had an impact on the providers as well. I have heard, uh, I, I have done studies at the state level uh, of, uh, for example, uh, Latino physicians, you know, and, and boy, this, this goes back to 2016, 17, and uh, about 40% of the physicians, uh, uh, the, the uh, Latino physicians, were scheduled to retire in the next 10 years, 40%, you know? And there is no replacement, not at the level uh, that is needed, certainly. And there is one profession that I highlight there, that 35% of the workforce is under age 30, uh, and, and that is the substance use disorder uh, counselors. Then I have a, a slide on, on the distribution of psychiatrists back to 2020 by race and ethnicity. And you can see that there are significant distributions in relationship to the uh, uh, representation of those uh, populations in, in, the, in, 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 in the California population. For example, in terms of psychiatrists, uh, it, it is, uh, uh, you know, Latinos, uh, we comprise about 40% of the California population. And uh, it is remarkable that there are 25% uh, uh, of, uh, of the psychiatrists that appear to be uh, uh, psychiatrists. In, and, and most importantly for this meeting is the race and ethnicity for the non-prescribing behavioral health professionals. In the, in the case of clinical and uh, counseling, Psychologists, the, this uh, disparity is even more pronounced because, for example, uh, once again, uh, Latinos comprise 40% uh, uh, of the population and only 9% uh, uh, of uh, this particular category that you are overseeing, the profession that you are overseeing. The other uh, information that I'm included in the slides is this projected demand and supply, uh, first for psychiatrists. And there are two scenarios, the one back in 2016, and there is certainly uh, uh, the, the demand exceeds the supply. But if we take a look at the crystal ball uh, to 2028, uh, uh, then uh, uh, this gap, between the supply and the demand is even more pronounced. And something similar is happening for the supply for uh, clinical psychologists, uh, licensed marriage and family therapists, uh, you know, licensed uh, clinical social workers, and in another profession. Uh, so uh, it doesn't look good in terms of the uh, supplying the demand uh, that uh, right now we have. Uh, I, I also uh, provide a little bit of information about the uh, graduates of educational programs for licensed behavioral health occupations. And I highlight uh, the, the one for uh, doctorates uh, in, in clinical psychology. And what I, is illustrated there is that uh, uh, in the last 
well, it's from 2016 to 2020, five years, there hasn't been really an increase, an important increase in uh, the number of uh, PhDs uh, in, in clinical psychology. So that is something that uh, also uh, requires attention and reflection and action uh, as well. Uh, and I have another slide on uh, the uh, graduates by race and ethnicity. Once again, back to 2020. And in terms of the doctorates, uh, doctorate uh, uh, in, in psychology, uh, there is a tremendous, once again, disparities in terms of uh, the uh, racial and ethnic makeup uh, of, uh, of the workforce as well. Um, I, I also included uh, a slide on graduates of educational programs for unlicensed behavioral health occupations. And, uh, you know, there are some that are, uh, you know, flat, uh, even though the, there are in, in some of the professions that are, uh, there is a, uh, an increase, the increase is modest as well. So uh, the story that is coming out is that uh, uh, we need to do a much better job, including us at UC Davis, let me tell you, uh, on, on how to prepare the behavioral health uh, uh, workforce. One thing that is important to consider, and I included this uh, article from the San Francisco Chronicle, because when I saw it, um, you know, given what I'm describing to you, uh, it was a little bit sobering, because between 2019 and 2020, uh, during the pandemic, uh, there was a significant decrease in those that were expected to enroll, 300,000 for community colleges. It, was, it just died in, died, uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, you know, in other crises, like for example, the recession that happened in 2008, 2009, uh, that's when uh, there is a, 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 an expected increase in enrollment. But in the case of COVID, it was totally the opposite. And uh, I included the quote that uh, captures uh, this notion. So uh, it, it is the impact of COVID. And what is happening? Well, these are a lot of uh, young, uh, uh, I mean, youth uh, who uh, were expecting to enroll uh, in uh, whatever, uh, uh, you know, tracks they wanted to choose in college, uh, but uh, you know, they had to work or, or they have to, you know, support the family in, in many respects. And uh, what is important is to emphasize that these are uh, the enrollees of the community colleges. In the CSUs, they did a much better, you know, because there was a, 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 not the increase that they were expecting uh, for enrollees, and you see, excuse me, the UC, uh, uh, well, in the UC system, uh, the increase was minimal, minimal. But community colleges, which are the ones who feed, which feed, you know, this diversity that, that we are talking about, and those who are committed, for example, to go back to the Central Valley, for example, uh, who come from those areas, uh, unfortunately, there was a decrease. And I also uh, include, include uh, a, a more recent article from the LA Times, and the headline is California Community College Enrollment Plummets uh, to 30-Year uh, Low. And then I provide you with uh, three slides with a little bit more uh, information about how this is uh, playing out. And as you can see, uh, uh, the, the, the slide uh, uh, number uh, 26, it illustrates how during the Great Recession that I just mentioned, there was an increase in uh, enrollment. But during COVID, it hasn't been this low, you know, in, in, in 30 years as well. Who is not enrolling? Well, when it comes to uh, race and ethnicity, American uh, Indians uh, are the, uh, you know, the ones uh, missing enrollment the most, followed by Black, Filipino, Latinos, and, and others. And uh, this is going to have an impact, is having an impact actually in increasing the, uh, certainly the diversity and, and just the number 
of those who uh, are going to comprise, uh, to, I mean, to be the workforce, the herbal health workforce uh, of the future. Another interesting, uh, at least to me, is uh, that uh, in terms of age, the largest drops in enrollment were among the adults 50 and older, who go back to, and, and they enroll in, in community colleges, for example. But also look at, look at, the, uh, at uh, you know, the age group of 20 to 24, and also 25 to 29. Uh, that is, uh, you know, I wish to bring you better news, but you know, that is the reality that uh, we are faced, uh, and you are faced as well, because you are policy ma makers and uh, uh, need to look at how the, uh, you know, I'm not telling you what to do, but uh, I know I, I read about the board of psychology. I, I, know, I, I know about it. Uh, so the next slide is, uh, and this is something that we have discussed uh, as part of the commission that I mentioned at the beginning and, and, and afterwards as well. What can be done? You know, what are some strategies for expanding the health workforce capacity? Last year, I was asked by the Steinberg Institute, you know, that they focus specifically on workforce uh, uh, development for behavioral health professionals specifically. And I spoke with uh, legislators and also the staffers of the legislators. And I presented uh, this slide that comes from Janet uh, Kaufman, who is a colleague from UC San Francisco, who has, uh, you know, focused her uh, uh, work uh, in her research, uh, specifically in these areas that I'm talking about. And it comes from her. Uh, and I want to acknowledge her contributions. So there are four domains that uh, are, uh, according to Janet Kaufman, to consider. One is to enhance the education uh, pipeline, and there are specific elements within th that uh, domain, like the expand training, recruit uh, people likely to practice in underserved populations, and prepare to care for underserved populations as well, that are uh, continue to be very much underserved. And these, by the way, these uh, recommendations or these uh, strategies are included in the report that I'm telling you about. It's worth reading. I would encourage you to take a look at it. Then recruit and retain uh, clinicians, like ro loan repayment. Uh, they were very interested, the legislators, on this particular uh, topic. And also, uh, you know, uh, out of the UC system, uh, uh, the, the leadership have been also looking at, at uh, loan re repayment, as well as other incentive programs. And, and, and also to provide uh, practice support as well. You know, I, I'm working with some counties that in terms of re, uh, recruitment and retention, especially for bilingual or trilingual uh, providers, behavioral health providers, they provide incentives, uh, you know, uh, and it is not only monetary, there are other incentives as well. Another domain is uh, maximize the existing workforce. And there are several things uh, within uh, several elements like delivery reform, state practice regulation, technology and payment reform. And I'm just going to mention very quickly uh, technology because now we have the technology to go to where people are. You know, I had been doing research on disparities, health disparities and mental health disparities for decades now. And I can tell you that uh, for too long, our systems of care, including UC Davis, uh, the medical center and the primary care network, for example, that we continue to operate by the most part uh, on the waiting mode. It is, we are there waiting for people when they feel sick enough to come and be referred to, uh, to, to the, you know, uh, lo locations that we have. Now we have the technology to where, to where people are. Uh, uh, two days ago, uh, we launched uh, a initiative funded by HRSA and funded by the California Department of Public Health uh, using mobile units to go uh, to uh, hard to reach populations where they are, you know, migrant centers, you know, in the rural areas. And we have been doing this for a while now, 
first with uh, testing and vaccinations, and now uh, we are using testing as, uh, as an anchor. You know, we go test people, those who are positive, right on the spot. We connect them through tablets to, uh, to be seen by a, a physician. You know, we have uh, this express care service at UC Davis, and they are seen in, you know, uh, I tested the, 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 the system this past uh, Wednesday afternoon, and the physician saw me in three minutes or four minutes, okay? And I spoke, uh, I, it was a mock interview, but uh, it, it is to have the services where people are using uh, tablets, and then once uh, uh, they are consulted by the physician, they can uh, uh, provide a treatment plan with uh, treatments, for example, antivirals, uh, uh, right on the spot. And we're shooting to have the medications, some of the basic medications in the advance. So once they are prescribed, we can give them right there, okay? But the other piece that is of critical importance for us is that we are linking them uh, to fairly qualified health centers. Here in Sacramento, we have uh, WellSpace, you know, which is by far the largest fairly qualified health center. And we uh, have digital health navigators that come from them, okay? This is, uh, uh, so we are uh, doing this in Sacramento County as a pilot and also in the Sacramento Valley, in Colusa, Butte, uh, uh, Glen, and, uh, and Saturn. Uh, and we are focusing on the hard to reach populations. But we can do that now. So the technology uh, is becoming an option that uh, I think that is so important that you keep it in your radar. Most likely you know all of this, but uh, you know, I encourage you uh, to think about it and, and reflect on it. The other one is leveraging data. Data is of critical importance. Accountability is of critical importance like data collection and uh, timely analysis that can help tremendously for planning. So uh, one thing that I found is uh, as I was looking at the most recent data available, uh, that data is not available for some of the professions, behavioral health professionals. It was like uh, really uh, uh, looking with the diogenes uh, lamp uh, and, and I, you know, I'm presenting what I was able to find uh, and after so asking some colleagues as well. So the conclusions, uh, and I have listed some, some of them. Some regions of California have a small numbers of behavioral health professionals per capita relative uh, to the state overall. Many behavioral health professionals are at or near retirement age. The behavioral, behavioral workforce does not reflect the racial, ethnic, and linguistic. I didn't include language here because of the time, you know, but there are significant uh, uh, disparities as well. Uh, linguistic diversity of the state's uh, population, especially in professions that require a doctoral degree. Numbers of graduates of educational programs will not be sufficient to replace retirees or meet growing demand for behavioral health services. Existing sources of data are not sufficient to fully assess the California behavioral health uh, workforce needs and to plan. You know, this is the point that I was making. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm hoping that you can, you, you, you can help with that and that I can come to you and that you have the data and I'll be very happy to, to, to have access uh, to that data. Uh, some recommendations, uh, invest in behavioral health professionals, professions education pipeline. Uh, programs which focus on underrepresented and low-income persons, especially at college and post-baccalaureate uh, levels, you know, is, and, and community colleges are absolutely uh, important uh, for, uh, for this purpose. Increase funding for clinical psychologists, psychiatry, residency uh, programs, and psychiatric, psychiatric nurse practitioners, uh, education programs, and provide funds for targeted increases in enrollment at the community colleges, once again, and, uh, but also the California medical and nursing schools. And then I have a couple of other list of recommendations that come from the California Future uh, Health Workforce Commission. I won't read that, uh, but uh, I would encourage you to take a look at it in your, at your leisure. Um, but, uh, you know, 
I hope that this is helpful in some ways. Uh, I spoke with, uh, you know, this past uh, uh, year uh, with Secretary uh, Lourdes Castro uh, Ramirez, and she is the one I think that put me in touch with the with the board, also with the behavioral the board of behavioral sciences, which I presented something similar uh, to them uh, uh, just uh, uh, this uh, the beginning of this uh, of this year as well. So I'm going to stop here. Want to thank you again for uh, allowing me to come and, and present this information uh, to you and. Uh, I don't know if uh, you, you, we still have a, 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 some uh, a, a time uh, for questions or for comments. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola. I, I love this kind of data because it's um, well researched and it's all in one place, which is amazing. Um, and a few things that come to my mind as you're presenting is. I feel like this board did a pretty good job of representation <laughs> of <laughs> California. And so I was excited. I, I, I feel that. And um, in, even among the psychologists on the board, and I'm one of those people from the really far away northern counties. And so um, we definitely feel the mental health need way up there. But seeing the data regarding the Bay Area, um, it seems like we have a lot of work to do in our profession to um, make it equitable for everybody across the entire state. So those are my just initial comments, but thank you. And I'm gonna open it up to the board if you have time to answer questions or receive comments, that'd be great. Thank you, Dr. Clay. Dr. Cervantes. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, I'm curious about the steps that um, the University of California has taken on um, on creating more opportunities uh, for uh, practitioners to, or for future practitioners to enter the training programs, PhDs in psychology at the University of California are known for being brutally competitive. <laughs> yes. And so I, it, just, um, it just strikes me as I'm um, looking at your work and thinking about where where one of those spaces is where there could be a, a statewide influence on the workforce and even in producing faculty to teach um, the next generation of the workforce because yeah. we do need to look at this long term. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about sure. that? Sure, I really like your uh, question. Very important and good question. Um, this is something that ever since I joined UC Davis and, and before I was uh, living in Fresno, uh, in Fresno County, uh, and I have been for, uh, as I mentioned, uh, almost two decades at UC Davis. Uh, I had been, at one point, I was a part of the admissions committee, you know, the, uh, the final group that, uh, you know, look at the, at the uh, uh, finalists and kind of based on different criteria that we were recommending for the ultimate decision makers. And I can tell you that uh, at UC Davis, uh, I think that we have done some progress. Uh, 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 we are, uh, you know, compared to the other UC systems, uh, we, uh, the, the percentage of first year medical students uh, who are uh, incredibly diverse is, uh, is, is, the, is the most diverse, not only of California, also nationwide among the most diverse. And it, 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 it has been, uh, you know, consistent work. It, it, it hasn't been done easily. And uh, I, I'm very, very happy to tell you that we have very specific programs recruiting, for example, uh, uh, medical students or those to become medical students from the San Joaquin Valley, for example. And we have something that we call Rural Prime as well. And, and it is with the intention, actually, to uh, train providers, in this case, primary care providers or whatever profession they, they decide uh, to, to, uh, to, to go, uh, if they want to be a psychiatrist or, or other professions as well. And with the idea of uh, getting them back uh, to where they are coming from. Something that we are doing, uh, and, and you know, uh, 
the second in command right now at the UC system overall, uh, right uh, by uh, uh, the, the president, uh, Michael Drake, uh, is uh, 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 is Carrie Byington, and Carrie is Latina. And I've been in several meetings with her in which she really has been focusing on how to increase the, the, the pipeline. Uh, one thing that, uh, that I'm alarmed uh, because of the uh, reduction in enrollment in community colleges is because the UCs across the board have this uh, agreement with community colleges that if they, they can transfer on, uh, at the end of the second year to the UCs, you know, much in a much more, uh, uh, I mean, in a faster route than if they were to apply. But you are right, uh, the, the competition is brutal, you know. In, I think that in the last uh, class that applied for medical school at UC Davis, there were like uh, nearly 8,000 applications for 120 spots. And in our profession, or the profession we regulate, psychology, isn't in the medical schools, right? Yeah, Those PhD you're right. programs are in the social science colleges. Yeah, you are right. And they are, from my, from um, what I've heard, I don't have data, but um, that even that process is brutally competitive. Yes. I have two more areas to sure. ask you that I didn't see in your recommendations, and I wondered um, how given the evidence that you found, how these might um, play a part. And I'll, I'll mention the two factors. Mm -hmm. One is in California, um, you don't have to graduate from an APA accredited program to earn a license. Mm -hmm. And so um, in your recommendations, that issue wasn't addressed. Some states, um, are considering uh, creating opportunities for other uh, mental health pro practitioners mm -hmm. uh, with additional training, uh, the ability to prescribe medication. And that is also not a topic that came up in your recommendations, but in terms of maximizing the workforce and filling that gap what do you see from the Dave, from the research that you've done in those two areas? Yeah, no, that's uh, those are great points, and and uh, and and you are right to point out that I was focusing more on on, on physicians. You know, uh, 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 last week I was invited for a celebration here in Sacramento, in the city. Mm -hmm. I was unable to make it, but uh, this came from the California Healthcare Foundation, mm -hmm. which has been a champion of increasing the number of psychiatric nurse practitioners. And uh, it was a part of the top 10 recommendations out of the commission. And they have continued to work towards that. And they have been funding programs for this particular profession uh, to make it happen. And they are, they are able to prescribe. And there has been a lot of politics, you know, that's, uh, I'm, I'm also a member of the board of the physicians uh, uh, for a Healthy California, which is a subsidiary of, of the California Medical Association. And the Medical Association was against, you know, the, the psychiatric nurse practitioners because of the prescription uh, uh, side of it. I come from a public health perspective, you know. I look at the needs of the population and how to best meet those needs. So I applaud those efforts, you know, not only with psychiatric nurse, nurse practitioners, uh, because the need is such that we need really qualified, and you're about quality as well. You are uh, overseeing the quality of the license, uh, 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 you know, behavioral health uh, professionals. Uh, but uh, I, I think that those kind of moves are uh, strategic moves are of critical importance. So that is just one example uh, that, uh, uh, you know, I'm heartened uh, about. But there are other professionals as well. On this, at the same time, let me tell you, uh, 
I was last was it last week. I think that it was last week in this uh, uh, National Governors Association that got together uh, in Santa Monica. Uh, they have focused their efforts uh, right now on youth mental health, youth mental health. And there was a lot of discussion about the uh, mental health rela related needs and the push by the government, uh, the, those who were in attendance, including the first uh, ladies and our first partner here in California was uh, to think about peer providers, for example, and to th think about promotoras and, and, and community health workers as well. Once again, because the need is such and the penetration that this uh, workforce has is important. So we need to think out of the box uh, based on, 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 on the need from, from my perspective. You're welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And as a byproduct of community college, uh, utilizing that transition system to the UC, I hope those numbers get better. Yeah. Um, big proponent of that. Um, anyway, um, I did want to mention later in our agenda today, and, and you might not be here for this, um, but we're going to be discussing our uh, barriers to telehealth survey, which we'll be sending out to both consumers and providers. And I'm hoping to utilize this as an opportunity to kind of check in with you and I'll follow up with you after um, about once we get those results, our hope is that perhaps one of the UC systems um, can take that information and write a white paper on it or kind of delve deeper into what that means and the implications. So I just wanna put in a plug for that if I can, and um, I will follow up with you on that later. Yeah, no, thank you so much for letting me know. I, I didn't know that and, and I'm, uh, you picked my interest and I would love to know more about it uh, be, because uh, as I said, we need to think in those terms uh, as well. And we are thinking in, in, in those terms. And uh, when you contact me, I'm gonna return uh, a, an excellent, excellent report that the White House, the Office of Science, uh, what is it, the Science Technology uh, Office uh, that they uh, came up with, a report back in May, uh, exactly about uh, telehealth uh, services. They did a, a, a nationwide uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, you know, collecting of information of key uh, stakeholders and the recommendations are terrific. I very, very thoughtful and very sensitive. So when you send me that, I'll send you that and, and other information that uh, my, my hope is that uh, may be useful for your purposes. But I'm looking forward to, I'm a researcher, so I'm looking forward uh, <laughs> to, to look at that information as well. Dr. Phillips or Dr. Kasuga? <laughs> I'm from the greater Bay Area, so I just wanted to say that although like um, I have a few comments and as well as um, some questions. So even though the, there's a lot of um, psychologists and uh, mental health practitioners in the greater Bay Area, there's still a shortage of um, healthcare, uh, mental health care practitioners in our area, just from the sheer number of, you know, people in, in our area. So I think that, um, you know, that those numbers should be looked into um, in those perspective, because um, I understand that in rural areas as well, there's like a shortage, but um, in urban areas, um, we're also struggling and we're seeing a rise of suicide and other, um, issues that are mm -hmm. as a consequence. Um, so one of the things that um, I just wanted to say as well, and um, whenever I see a shortage, I always think about um, wages. The same thing with like the teacher shortage, right? Like no one wants to be in the, the teaching profession because of the, the, um, the, sal the wages that our you know, teachers get for the work that they do. And I, I think that a psychologist, in California, and you know, like I, um, I can definitely attest to this. Um, we are grossly underpaid, and um, 
for the for the work that we do, even compared to psychiatrists. So that's like a big disparity for like the the loans that we we incur, and even if loan repayment is helpful, um, if you are given a choice between working in underserved um, communities with like you know very low pay and loan repayment versus you know getting paid a lot like you would you would choose the other just because you know you you need a livable wage so mm -hmm. i think that there are that there are elements in california systems in california that really keep wages for psychologists low and i think that um that there's a need to look into ways we can increase and um just like make make it more equitable among different like um, mental health practitioners, the, the, you know, the, the salary, the compensation for the services that we provide. And that will make an impact with the, like, the most underserved communities in this state. So that's something that I really want to, you know, I'm really hoping that we can partner with you with regards like trying to get more data on that because that will be really helpful in, in even with like bringing it to legislators and showing like <laughs> what, like how low we're, we're, um, psychologists are getting paid and um, um, what could be the appropriate compensation statewide, you know, if there are minimums or other, other ways we can increase that. That would encourage more people to yeah. enter our profession instead of working at Silicon Valley. <laughs> yes, no, I, I agree with you. You know, uh, there is a, a significant differential in, in, uh, in, in, in compensation for the professional uh, uh, services and, and also uh, uh, the, the loans that people take. You know, it really has uh, uh, have been, in, uh, it has been a, a limiting limiting factor for the distribution, you know, to have a better, uh, a more evenly distribution of them. Uh, that's why, you know, in addition to the loan repayment, another element was, uh, uh, was uh, incentive programs that recognize, for example, uh, uh, going to practice in, in a rural area, let's say in the Salinas Valley or in Imperial Valley, uh, and uh, the, these are the, these are things that we collectively ought to be looking at, mm -hmm. you know, to make it much more equitable and attractive as well. You know, I'm going to be giving uh, a talk tomorrow uh, to uh, well, there's going to be like 1,000 uh, uh, high schoolers. It's going to happen at the Mexican consulate, and it's going to be on youth mental health, and I'm going to tell them. You know, that I came and, 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 and spoke with you uh, and share a little bit of the data with them mm -hmm. and to encourage them to, and this is called Steps to College. You know, this is a, a, an event that happens uh, every year. And, and uh, I'm planning to look at them uh, and, and, and say, as far as I'm concerned, you are leaders. You know, you are leaders uh, in, in, the, in the potential that you have. And to kind of instill, you know, a sense of uh, that uh, uh, that often is missed, that uh, they, they they have a tremendous potential. But uh, uh, you are right. Uh, I think uh, uh, it, it is not by uh, by uh, uh, accident that uh, uh, those who have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, racial ethnic groups that we know. Uh, have uh, uh, less income, for example, that they incur in much greater uh, uh, loans amounts. And, and then I, I know several of my students who are in that, that situation right now. And, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll convey your, your uh, you know, comments uh, to uh, the people that I, uh, I in, in, uh, that interact with as well. And thank you for those comments. And definitely, uh, I think incentive programs are, are great, especially for particular types of practitioners that we want to attract um, 
uh, one of the things that I'm really, really passionate about is um, uh, language, um, language specific, um, I mean, um, services that like are uh, provided by kind of like, you know, Spanish speaking, like Farsi speaking, like all the, the specific languages that, that um, you know, California, there are lots of Californians there, um, you know, there's diversity in like languages that are spoken by, by you know, residents of California. And um, it's so hard to find um, practitioners in that speak particular languages in, in California. There's a big need for those um, and incentive programs that like um, that provide, um, you know, more income and, and more like um, incentive for for us to attract those types of like um, practitioners will be very, very important in California. Yeah. Um, so I, I like how you brought up um, thinking outside the, bo the box and like all of those, the mobile um, um, services. And I'm thinking for practitioners, for licensees that are interested in participating in those like um, type of um, kind of like you know, services like the mobile units and um, how can they get involved? I mean, some of them may be living in like, you know, other parts of like, kind of like in the Bay Area or, you know, in LA, but they want to like go to a reservation and, um, you know, provide services there and connect, you know, um, people there to, you know, practitioners that are nearby, I mean, closer to them for, for ongoing, you know, services, but to just like, um, maybe do assessments um, uh, once in a while, either pro bono or hopefully with a grant, you know, so they can get compensated for, you know, um, for their for their work. Like, how can they get involved? Is there like a network of, um, or like um, agencies or organizations that they can connect with to get more information on how they can involve If you can send like me an email, I'll follow up with, with, with that. You know, as I mentioned, in the California Future Health Workforce Commission, there were 80 organizations that were involved. Okay. Just in the behavioral health uh, priority area, there were, you know, over uh, uh, over 20. It was closer to 30. So I'll, uh, uh, and I'll discuss it with some colleagues as well. And, and uh, we'll be happy to, to be back uh, to you. But uh, it, it takes the uh, you know the coll a collective effort you know to see how we can remedy at least provide some remedy uh, to uh, to these uh, uh, incredible challenges that we have can i be there bearing with you uh, you know because as you were bringing that up and that i mentioned these uh, steps to college that is going to happen tomorrow uh, i thought uh, you know and my youngest son taught me how to take a panoramic picture. Can I take a picture of you and put it in my presentation to the kids tomorrow and say, this is the board, you know, that, uh, you know, can be very helpful in the future. Is it okay if I do that? Can I have your permission to do that? As long okay. as the board is fine with it, so, I'm fine with it. <laughs> it this is the time. <laughs> Yeah, Ms. this is the time to... Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Fu would like a special touch-up. Yes. Yeah, there you go, there you go. Uh, no, and, and I want to make uh, my, my son proud as well. We'll see how it goes. There we go. One. Reverse. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. So I'm going to, I promise that I'm going to include this picture in what I'm going to be presenting to the kids tomorrow. Thank you. You're so welcome. I, I guess I wanted to take the economic angle um, a little bit differently. And that is, if you go to a research, traditional research university like UCLA or Berkeley or USC or wherever, largely your graduate education is paid for. Mm -hmm. Part of getting into those programs is to make a commitment to become a researcher rather than to become a practitioner. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that the UC system is really that um, the philosophy and the programs are that um, geared toward creating practitioners, although many people do go on to becoming practitioners. 
Um, what you have is a number of other graduate programs, professional schools of psychology and other mm -hmm. accredited programs, right. as well as regionally accredited uh, universities mm -hmm. that are providing these programs, but there is no subsidization at all for the graduate education. So I teach in a professional school of psychology. It's not un unusual at all for a PhD student to graduate with two hundred and fifty or three hundred thousand dollars in debt, and they may be carrying yes. also their undergraduate debt with them. So right. I've had students that had half a million dollars of debt when they left. That creates an incentive to try to position yourself in the market so that you're serving wealthier people because you can get better insurance reimbursement, you can get better direct pay from. So part of even in the counties where I think where there are more representation of uh, psychologists, for instance, I think there's a skewing of the marketplace so that it's still very difficult to find people that will serve low income people outside of community health clinics. And the people that choose to go into community health clinics as a psychologist really take it on the chin because they're not paid comparably to the other psychologists. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of economic maldistribution, even within areas, I think, that do have a lot of practitioners. Um, I, I will mention one other thing, which is that I think that the counties that have an overrepresentation relative to other counties of mental health practitioners are also counties um, where there are more people likely to use mental health services that some of the more rural or agricultural areas. Mm -hmm. I think the need is equally important there, but cultural attitudes often get in the way of people making use of the services. So I think that makes it challenging for practitioners that decide to move to less populated areas of the state. So it's a very complicated question, but I think economics is a very important aspect of it um, because I think part of the reason less people are going to graduate school and perhaps why people from underrepresented communities are not going to graduate school is that they would incur so much debt in order to be able to do it um, that it's not a very attractive alternative when they start to think about what they're going to re what they're going to yield out of that degree. Um, because I think the statistic is, I believe this is correct. I heard this from a former member of the board. The number one major in, in undergraduate education is psychology that converting over to people that want to actually practice some form of psychology or mental health mm -hmm. services. Um, obviously, people aren't continuing to pursue that when they go on to the graduate level. So, um, but I really appreciated your presentation. I think it's, it's really important. I know in the graduate program that I teach in, um, BIPOC people uh, are actually the majority of the students in the programs, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's representative <coughs> of all the graduate programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with all the points that you made, you know, excellent points. And I think that is uh, that angle, you know, the business case of uh, the, uh, to, to have a, a, a better supply and uh, also a more even distribution uh, of, uh, uh, of providers. And, and I agree with you, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, for example, out of the three educational systems in California, yeah, UC tends to be the one more focused on on research, but uh, you know, uh, and 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 uh, thank goodness for uh, professional schools. You know, I have been in touch with colleagues uh, from Alain University, uh, have very good relations with Palo Alto University as well, and 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 other other universities that are, uh, you know, really uh, uh, helping with the supply. Uh, and it is of critical importance, uh, uh, you know, to uh, stimulate that even further. Uh, uh, can I ask uh, which uh, uh, professional university are you teaching? I teach at Alliant. Alliant, huh? Ah. Yeah. Uh, in San Diego or? Los Angeles. Ah, Los Angeles, yeah. No, terrific. Yeah, uh, and it's wonderful to see the diversity of my classes. It makes it a much richer experience. Um, yeah. And we have a much broader perspective on psychology, I think, as a result. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think one of the other th things that's problematic, and I can speak about this as somebody that's gay, is that when you're placed in clinical placements, then you get all the gay patients. You don't have an opportunity sometimes to work with other populations. Right. And I know for a lot of my colleagues that are bilingual or trilingual, that they end up kind of getting burned out. Yeah. 
on having to serve only one population. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also a very difficult thing. Uh, yeah. It makes a lot of sense, yeah. And it resonates, what you said just resonates uh, with me. I wish to have, have recorded what you said, really, because it's very thoughtful, very, you know, reflective as well. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. I really enjoyed your presentation. And I was actually thinking along the lines of Dr. Phillips about the economic piece as it relates to recruiting and uh, retaining people to enter the workforce um, because it can be cost prohibitive for graduate studies, applying for licensure, taking the licensing exams, um, maybe taking them multiple times if you didn't pass the first time. And so I know we've spoken about some incentive programs once people enter the field, but is there is there funding for people that are in training so that they can get to the finish line to be able to enter the workforce? Because if the costs are so high to get the degree and to enter the workforce, people you know, may choose another profession. So I was just curious if you had any information about that. Yeah, well, that's a great question. And, and do you know, I, uh, I learned, uh, I, part of my training was at UC San Francisco. And uh, 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 when I was there, and that was in the middle of the 80s uh, for my PhD, uh, uh, I learned that there is funding for almost anything. If you go to the, uh, for example, the foundation uh, is called, uh, it has a name. And you there is a database and you enter exactly the descriptors that you, you, you would like to. Most likely you are going to find uh, potential funding, okay? Uh, but more tangibly, uh, I, uh, my center work uh, uh, has been focused, uh, you know, for, uh, since we started in 2018, uh, excuse me, 2005, uh, we had been focusing on solutions for, achieve, for advancing mental health equity. And we worked with Solano County for about seven years uh, to uh, help uh, and help. We didn't accomplish that ourselves. It was a collective effort uh, to help transform uh, mental health service delivery. Uh, and that came from the communities who were really uh, asking for uh, a, a greater access and utilization of quality services. And we focused, they asked us to focus on the three most historically underserved populations that they continue to serve. And those are uh, Latinos, uh, Filipinos, and LGBTQ. And, and uh, uh, thankfully, you know, after working uh, for uh, about seven years, uh, we were able to document uh, that it is indeed possible to advance health equity uh, in those historically underserved uh, communities. And the other communities benefited from that as well. And I'm bringing all of this to just to tell you that they, uh, you know, the participants, we did an intervention with uh, in-depth trainings uh, using the, the uh, cultural linguistic appropriate services standards as a framework. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, the participants, three cohorts, that they uh, 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 develop uh, quality improvement action plans. Okay? And I remember one specifically about uh, uh, recruitment and retention of uh, behavioral health professionals in Solano County. And they, 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 they now they have it in the policies uh, that, uh, for example, that bilingual uh, providers uh, that they recruit, they have an incentive program. And, and, and also they have other incentives uh, that they learn, you know, through uh, 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 certainly the, 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 what we did, I think that it helped to, uh, to make uh, the need more uh, more palpable and to do something about it. So they are putting in the water some uh, policy uh, to be able to recruit and retain, uh, you know, uh, the few providers uh, 
uh, that are available. But uh, I, I, I think that uh, uh, this can happen in many other places. Uh, and I mentioned previously, I said, uh, uh, it is not only about, uh, uh, you know, monetary incentives. There are other things that attract people, you know, how meaningful the work that they are doing it plays a, a significant role. To what extent they feel that they are a part of, uh, you know, something that, that uh, uh, helps them, uh, you make a difference, you know, the feeling. It is like provider satisfaction, you know, which now is included uh, as part of the triple aim, now the quadruple aim, you know. And uh, uh, so I, uh, uh, I, those are just, uh, is one example. But there are other, uh, I think that if, and, and I know that Solano County is, is working with the uh, local community colleges, uh, with Tuoro University as well, which is uh, local as well, to, for the pipeline. And part of their, the, uh, one of the action plans is to start as early as high school, you know, getting them and to, uh, so they can, they can look at, a, a, at the operation and, and to uh, plant seeds uh, for uh, the workforce of the future. If we were to do something like that in a more systematic manner, you know, to think through as to what are the key factors, uh, you know, between the different entities, uh, uh, for example, the community colleges or, or the institutes of higher learning and the counties and the state, state uh, uh, programs and the federal programs as well and foundations. I think that, uh, you know, uh, something coordinated, something deliberate uh, can, uh, can help, uh, um, I, I, would, uh, I would anticipate, can, can make a difference as well. Thank you for your reply. Um, I have one other question about the uh, mobile clinics that you were talking about. I think that's really innovative, um, especially I've been thinking a lot about how to reach communities, uh, especially during the pandemic when lots of people couldn't get access. And as we've talked about the disparities as it relates to telehealth, um, I'm curious just in terms of um, going into communities that need to have greater access, how do you structure your follow-up care so that there's some continuity in treatment? Yeah. I was just curious if you could speak to that a little more. That's a wonderful question, necessary question, actually. Uh, throughout the pandemic, we have had like five or six uh, uh, COVID-related funding, you know, from different funding uh, sources, including the National Institutes of Health, uh, CDC. Uh, the state has been a, a, a key funder as well. So we have, uh, for example, had mobile units, several mobile units that go uh, to here in Sacramento County, in Yolo County, in the Central Valley as well, Fresno, Madera, uh, Me uh, Stanislaus. And now we are doing uh, the Northern California, the Sacramento Valley, as I mentioned. And one of the things that we are doing is, uh, is this combination or the integration of three, uh, you know, uh, uh, three major uh, uh, areas uh, uh, for, for the work that we are currently doing, you know, and that is community engagement. It is to really, in a meaningful manner, to go uh, to where the needs are, to go to where usually people are way underserved, uh, like uh, migrant centers, someone mentioned migrant centers, and, uh, and, and to establish trust, because it's not just enough to go and show up from time to time in an uh, in, in unscheduled manner, you know? Uh, but if you go, let's say, every Tuesday to, to a migrant center, and, and, and the people who come uh, for whatever service we are providing, and, and, and they start uh, talking with the promotoras, for example. We have a bunch of promotoras. Uh, they, they, they become familiar, you know? And I have seen that in many, many respects. Uh, 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 
Uh, for example, uh, at the beginning when we were providing uh, testing services, the, the, there was a lot of uh, a lot of uh, reservation that the parents would come and 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 then later I saw the mothers bringing the two-year-olds, you know, to be tested. That is trust, I thought. That is uh, trustworthiness that we needed to demonstrate that we are there, you know, uh, hopefully for uh, a longer term. So uh, what we are combining is community engagement in which trust and trustworthiness are front and center. Second, uh, the, the, pro, the, 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 the service that we developed since uh, September of 2020 at UC Davis, which is called Express Care. And that is that no matter where you are, in the state or in the nation or, you know, wherever you are, you can get connected to this express care. And in less than an hour, you know, you are talking with someone who is going to see you. I got COVID, you know, for the first time back in November. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it turned out to be positive on a Sunday night. And I wrote to my primary care doc uh, on Sunday night. Uh, and the following day, I used express care. It took me about 40 minutes to, for the provider to, uh, to uh, speak with me. And on the spot, he prescribed uh, a medication that was very helpful. My wife also had COVID, you know, in December. She was in LA and she, uh, she was even, even more fortunate, more blessed than me because in five minutes, she was speaking with, uh, with the provider. And the provider not only uh, was providing an antiviral, but she took the, upon herself to look for a Walgreens that was close in the location to where my wife uh, was staying. You know, wonderful, wonderful service. So it is community engagement, it's a service like Express Care, and it is uh, the connection uh, to the uh, fairly qualified health centers. Like for example, here in, in Sacramento County, I don't know if, if, if you are local, uh, if you know WellSpace Health. They, they, it, this is the largest uh, FQ in the county. Uh, they see like 130, 140,000 uh, patients. That, that, is, that is the patient census that they have. 31 clinics, nine of those are behavioral health clinics, by the way. They provide uh, the services. And that is for continuity of care. So just picture. Like what happened on, on this uh, Wednesday, or, or it's going to happen on Saturday as well, that uh, we go uh, at a public place where we know that people will gather. Actually, we are going to be tomorrow at the steps to college, and we anticipate that a lot of people are going to get tested. Those who get tested and are positive and that are, let's say, uh, with hypertension or diabetes, uh, with mental health issues that, you know, come up, and we have some screeners that can give us an idea. Then uh, we have digital health coordinate, uh, navigators, we call them, which come from uh, WellSpace, actually, uh, but are being paid by the funding that we got. And right on the spot, they connect them with uh, WellSpace for continuity of care. Not only them, but their families. So we can establish right there the connectivity for a medical home, you know, or for a health home. Uh, and uh, I cannot tell you how excited I am because I have been working in this health space, uh, health equity space for decades. And this is the first time that I see, my goodness, we can go to them, you know? And, 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 and you know, if it is not, uh, we're using testing as an entry point, but we can go to the places and we can do uh, hypertension, for I mean, we can do blood pressure, we can do uh, uh, glycemia, for example, we can do uh, the P PHQ-9 as, an, as, as, a, as a screener, we can do several other things. And right there on the spot, we can find someone that is in need and connect them uh, uh, right on the spot once again and connect them for continu continuity of care as well. So you, you really touch a, a nerve. <laughs> well, I'm so glad to have heard you elaborate on it. And I really appreciate what you're saying about um, continuity in 
building trust in communities, right? That's how you get people to come and get tested and then eventually tell a friend or a family member um, so that you can provide more care within communities that really need it. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Word of mouth is very powerful in these communities. Yeah. Madam President, I can ask my question, but I also want to check in to see if you want to take a quick break for any members who may wish for. I'm thinking we can finish with board comment. And... Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, I do have the benefit of working with the California Healthcare Foundation on a somewhat frequent basis. And so um, it was a, only happened to be a byproduct of that, uh, <laughs> that working relationship with them that I had a chance to review this, um, especially when they came out with the report last January. Um, providing an update on the progress of the commission. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that the board has done over, I think, in the last two or three years is added the National Registry for Health Services Psychologists um, to part of the uh, credentialing work for non um, for psychologists not trained in the United States or in Canada. Um, we also made some modifications to the National Association of Credentialing and Evaluation Services um, that allowed for um, additional review um, of these not of these transcripts. I I'm curious if, in as a part of the discussions for the workforce um, commission, if there was discussion about um, the barriers for non psychologists trained in the United States and Canada um, with regard to licensure, um, with respect to also not compromising consumer protection. Mm -hmm. um, and in recognition of the fact that many of the pipeline recommendations you have put in place are, are a 10 year solution um, to, but not necessarily an immediate um, uh, resolution to the insufficient workforce we have presently. So I would be curious to hear about the um, conversation that was had with regard to um, uh, non-US uh, non and ca uh, Canada-based um, psychologists um, with those degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, and I think that that could be another mechanism that can be used. Actually, it's being used uh, right now. The reason why I had the pleasure to speak with Secretary Castro Ramirez was because uh, my center is evaluating a program uh, you know, funded by the California, the Medical Board of California, uh, that is uh, bringing licensed uh, physicians, primary care physicians from Mexico, you know, and uh, this is a program on the works for 20 some years. It's in the law, you know, a law, uh, this is AB 1045 that passed uh, back in 2001, and it took 20 some years to uh, start implementing. There are 22 primary care physicians right now, you know, pediatricians, uh, OBGYNs, family uh, and, and community medicine docs. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there are no psychiatrists <clears throat> who are now uh, licensed by the, by the medical board uh, temporarily uh, to work uh, in, in California. And they are uh, deployed in four different uh, fairly qualified health centers. There is one in, <coughs> in uh, Salinas, uh, the Clinicas uh, uh, del Valle de Salinas. There is one in San Benito, one in Tulare, uh, Altura, and then Altamed, which, uh, you know, the largest FQ uh, in the nation, I believe, uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, even though this started uh, uh, to be focused on the rural areas, uh, the, in the case of Altamed, the, the need is such, and the shortage uh, also is such that uh, they jump to this opportunity. So if this can be done with this group, and by the way, the law is not only physicians, it's also dentists as well, but we are not doing dentists uh, at the present time. But uh, you know, it can be done with any profession because there are other places in which uh, we can attract them. I, I reviewed the data, <coughs> that data that I didn't present to you, there was not enough time. But if you take a look at the pipeline 
of psychiatrists, the residency training programs, you know, about 80%, about 80% uh, are from uh, US uh, graduates that get into uh, residency training programs in psychiatry. The rest, about 20%, you know, uh, are from other countries. And, and uh, that includes, uh, thank you so much, Antonia. Uh, that includes uh, Canada, includes India, includes uh, Russia, includes uh, so many different countries. So uh, we, we really need to think out of the box, you know. Uh, all of this is based in need. What is it that our populations, especially some communities, need? And uh, I think that is of critical importance that we really come up with, uh, with potential solutions. So what you're saying is, uh, you know, right on target, I think. And would, uh, would love to see a similar, uh, you know, effort because the reality is that uh, with all the professional uh, schools that, you know, uh, we won't be able to keep up with the supply. We won't. You know, it is incredibly regulated for a good reason. You mentioned protection. And it is incredibly important to do it. But uh, we're not the only country in the world who have, uh, you know, very high standards. There are others as well. And I can tell you, I can attest that the 22 primary care dogs uh, coming from Mexico, they were incredibly well selected and it's working so wonderfully. And they speak the language, they know the culture. Uh, those who come for services, they want them. You know, they really bring the family. Uh, uh, actually, it was Secretary uh, Castro Ramirez that uh, I think that she talked with uh, some of the uh, some of the recipients of those services, and she was impressed. That, if I remember correctly, of saying, "Oh my God, these are very needed services." So uh, let's continue to think out of the box. Uh, one more comment, um, which is quick, around I think Dr. Rogers' question with regard to continuity of care. Um, the California Healthcare Foundation, along with um, Mark Horvath at Invisible People, has done, I think, a really excellent job at talking about street medicine, um, particularly with um, working with um, individuals who are unhoused. Um, and so that's an interesting area, I think, that we're following um, uh, in my my daytime job. And then secondly, um, I, I do know that the city of Long Beach, um, who received the governor's um, unsheltered, um, excuse me, who received uh, uh, state funds for encampment resolutions, um, along with the Hilton Foundation, um, where I work, um, are, uh, is piloting actually a mobile mental health clinic um, in the city of Long Beach mm -hmm. um, to work with people um, who are in an unsheltered setting um, and providing and helping with that continuity of care for mental health services. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Oh, no, absolutely. I, I went to my ophthalmologist. Uh, I think that it, it, it was this Wednesday. Or, and, you know, I she has been seeing me for uh, 14 years or so. Uh, she, uh, I had surgery because of her glaucoma uh, in one of my eyes. And guess what? You know, when I see her, uh, she sent me an email uh, prior to my visit. And she said, I want to know how are you uh, renting or buying the, the vans because we want to have a, a, a mobile eye clinic. Music to my ears, you know, music to my ears. And so I, I'm heartened uh, uh, by that. I'm heartened by uh, what is happening in LA, for example, the health medicine, I mean, the, the, the street medicine. And it's happening in other places as well, you know. And, and, and once again, there is no reasons why we, we shouldn't do more, more of that. Um, <laughs> should be somewhere else. But I'm so fascinated here. You know, I, I need to let them know that. Uh, <laughs> well, let, let me help you. <laughs> Is there any more board comment? Let me open up public comment. If you have a comment, please come forward and have a seat. Has, no, in relation to this presentation. Turn on, the, yeah, turn on the microphone and pull it to you. Yeah, Dr. Sanchez, 
was just wondering if you broke down the numbers more because I think it's in, it might be helpful to know where are we uh, in terms of uh, psychologists because it seems like a lot of discussions was more geared towards a private practitioner, but we are in so many areas. We're in state hospitals, we're in prisons, we're in community centers, um, and uh, we work with adults, we work with children. So the needs may be different based on where we are. So I don't know if you had a chance to look at that or maybe in the future. Excellent question, and I, uh, I'm, uh, give me the that as her homework because the data that I have seen uh, doesn't disaggregate uh, at that level. Okay. But it's very important because uh, for planning purposes and, and for availability of services as well. And you are right, I, that's what I suspect, uh, you know, this combination of uh, uh, various practices, you know, the, the private, private sector or, or the public sector as well. And one other comment, and I think it was mentioned here, the, the, the pay has to be part of recommendations. Yeah, the, I can agree a, more. If we're going to get people to go into the profession, the, the pay has to be uh, higher. And I, I know that uh, in state services, uh, I worked in corrections. When we got a raise, we sucked a lot of practitioners from the community and from the state hospitals. And so we have to look at, at, the, at the ripple effect. Yes. And, uh, and, and the only way to, to make that uh, work is to make sure we compensate everyone equally. Yeah. To, 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 to. Thank you. Totally agree. Is there any other public comment? If so, please come forward and have a seat. Okay, I'm not seeing any movement. So thank you so much, Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola. We really appreciate it. My thank pleasure. You. And we'll thank be taking you. a 10 minute break. So please come back at 1130. Thank you. Thanks for coming back so promptly. Ms. Bruteau, can you please call the roll? Katiba. Here. Cervantes. Here. Food. Hi. Hard sheets. Here. Nice room. Phillips. Here. Muscate. Here. Rogers. Here. Eight. Here. Thank you. Quorum is established, and we're going to dive right into agenda item 15. And just for everyone's knowledge, I'm planning on pushing forward to 12.45 and then break for lunch. So if you need to make plans, do so. Um, item 15 is public comment for items not on the agenda. The board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised during this public comment section, except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting. Before I invite speakers to come forward for public comment, I would ask individuals making comments to not discuss the specifics, including names, as to pending complaints, pending licensing applications, or pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. This refers to current and pending complaints and including possible future complaints. Such discussions are considered ex parte communications as it could provide information to the members that is outside of the record in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. While there may be a desire to engage in further discussion with comments presented during this time, the board may not discuss or take action at this time. This may give the impression we are not being responsive. These procedures are critical to ensure the compliance with the Open Meetings Act and to avoid compromising the speaker's goals or the board's mission. And in addition, if there is a speaker before you who expresses thoughts who are extremely similar to yours, please feel free to verbally agree with previous speakers instead of repeating the exact same comment. If you have a comment, please have a seat in front of the microphone and each speaker will have two minutes. This is the time for any public comment. If you do have a comment, please come forward and have a seat. This is the time, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Wait. Oh, it's not. Wait, hold on. Yep. And just pull the microphone as close as you can so we can hear you clearly. And I do not know if this is the appropriate forum. Um, I'm here um, because I have concerns about the numerous times that I've taken the EPPP exam and not passed. Um, my last score was a 490. And I do, again, I I have hired every. I purchased every test prep company that's out there. I've hired private tutor. I've participated in psychotherapy, hypnotherapy, 
My last score was a 490. And so my concern is that there's this test with very low pass rate in the state of California, especially for those of us that have taken it multiple times. It's like in the 38% rate. I've been told this is a legally defensible exam. Um, the score report that you get at the end looks something like a bar graph. And the mark changes every single time you take the test. The test is different every single time. So I have been working for the Department of Corrections. Tomorrow marks my fourth year with the department. There is a rule in the state of California that you must pass the exam within four years or you can lose your job. Um, I have an extenuating circumstance related to a medical condition that's very serious. We have asked for that one-year extension that they can give. We still have not heard if that's going to be granted or not. So if I lose my job, I lose my health care. So I'm concerned. I am an intelligent person. I've worked very, very hard. And to be struggling at this level has become frustrating. And I have to continue. I have to push forward. I want to be licensed. I love my job. I actually work in the Office of Employee Wellness for the Department of Corrections. And last year, I wrote a suicide prevention curriculum for correctional workers that is now being trained to employees statewide in the Department of Corrections. I'm very passionate about the work that I do. I really love helping the people and the families that work in corrections, um, the officers, the nurses, the things that they encountered during COVID. Like I, I want to continue doing this very important work. Um, we're a tiny little team with just a few psychologist, but we do our best to provide services throughout the state, and now I'm facing not being able to do that. So I just want to know, where do I go? Where do I get help? I've called ASPPB. I've left messages. I've sent emails with no response. To me, to be at 490 after, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times I've taken the test. So that's why I came today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you've utilized all of your time. The board cannot comment or yeah. get into a back and forth at this time, so we can listen to the information. Mm -hmm. We thank you for providing us with that information, um, but we can't provide advice. Um, at, okay, at, that's understood. At this. Um, Give us a moment. I really appreciate your time, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your comments, and thank you for your time. OK, thank you so much. I appreciate it. We're moving on to agenda item number 16, the Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Committee updates. The chairperson for that committee is Dr. Cervantes. Hello. Um, all right, here we go. We had a very productive week this week on the legislative and regulatory affairs front. And so I'm happy uh, to serve on this committee and to provide um, an update. And I serve on this committee with Drs. Kasuga and Dr. Phillips. Um, a warm welcome to Troy Polk, uh, who just came in to support this important work of the board. And he's sitting in the back. Oh, a little bit more. I got my computer in the way. Hold on, folks. Let me rearrange myself here. All right. So let's get started. Item 16. Some of the items are, um, some of the items we'll be referring to are in the hand carry folder. And we'll get to those in a minute. So I 
And then I'm going to recuse myself on any of the items uh, under uh, 16. Sure. Thank you. Uh, any items that require legislative action. Thank you for the clarification. We do have regulatory language. Okay, so item 16A, board legislation for the 2023 um, year. Uh, this will be uh, brief because we're at the start of uh, the first year of the two-year legislative session. The bill proposed, some of the bill proposals just received bill numbers and have not been analyzed. So we'll um, have more on that at the next Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Committee and then here at the board in May. Um, item 16A on the agenda, we're gonna review four informational items, then open for board and public comment. So we'll go through those four items now. Uh, the first one is a fee schedule. So this is item 16A1, fee schedule, business and professions code section 2987. This information is on page 90 of the combined packet. Mr. Burke. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cervantes. This is an, um, I, an informational item about the board's fee bill language as the board is aware we haven't increased our fees statutorily since 1992. Um, the board is um, experiencing a structural deficit and to stave off insolvency the board um, is seeking a legislative fee increase. Um, the language that the board approved in April 2022 has been submitted to the Senate and Assembly Business Professions Committees. Um, they have acknowledged receipt. Um, we have had several conversations with them and we have a meeting scheduled on Monday for um, to discuss this in our uh, legislative BCP, which was discussed yesterday. Um, so we'll hope to have a lot more. It, it's, we hope things will start to move quickly, but um, that's, that's where we are with this bill at the moment. Uh, there was an item included in the hand carry. There's no action on that. Um, it was actually uh, Dr. Rogers, I believe, found there was um, a drafting error in the in the language. Um, the uh, dollar amounts that were written out and then put in the parentheses didn't match on a couple of them, and the, that's since been corrected, but it's been corrected to what the board had previously approved. It was just a drafting error by staff for which I apologize. So that's the only, um, that's the update for that one. Are there any questions from the board? We're, we're gonna go through the four informational items and then open for board comment. Is that okay with everyone? Okay, just for, for flow. <laughs> so item 16A2, suicide risk assessment and intervention coursework in aging and long-term care coursework, business and professions code sections 2915.4 and 2915.5. Um, Mr. Burke. This um, language was part of the board's omnibus bill proposal. It's been submitted to the Senate, and we heard during our uh, legislative visits this week that um, that has been accepted for inclusion in the omnibus bill. So we look forward to seeing it. You know, it'll get a bill number, and um, omnibus bills generally don't get any opposition, so it looks like it's, it's, it's very good news. Thank you, and just a, a reminder, because of the timing of our meeting, updates on, on this item have are kind of happening in real time. So thank you for that update. I forgot to mention that item number two is page 94. Num item 16A3, patient privilege, business and professions code section 2918. Uh, begins on page 97 of the combined packet. Uh, Mr. Burke. Thank you very much. Um, this is language that has uh, that came out of the board's cust uh, child custody stakeholder meetings. Um, the board approved the language in in May, and we have submitted the language to um, multiple offices seeking an author. We haven't heard um, it has no bill author at this time, but the language was submitted unbacked to legislative council. So we've 
we've met that deadline and we have until February the 17th to, to find an author for this bill. Um, Ms. Sorek. Um, I don't know if you, uh, this is gonna be an action uh, required because the language um, looks slightly different from what the board approved back in May of 2021. Um, and it's based on uh, input and feedback uh, from our child custody stakeholders. So I don't know if you wanna address the informational items first and then come back to this. Up to you, Dr. Cervantes. Um, yes, Let, let's um, address them as informational items and then come back to that language change. I just wanna be consistent in, in how we're receiving public board comment and public comment so that we can just focus on that item. Is that okay with everyone? Okay, so, so this is the information we have now. We're gonna come back and look at the changes in the language that were in the hand carry. For item 16A3, the language is in the, it's not in the hand carry? Oh, okay, I see it. Okay. Let's come back to the, to just to the, to focus on the changes. Um, item 16A4, California Psychological Association Legislative Proposal 2023, Business and Professions Code 2914. And this, this item begins on page 101 of the combined packet. So this is an informational item. Did we want to adopt it? Okay, let's back up then. So that's what we have for 16A1 and 2. So A 16A1 was informational that Mr. Burke provided. 2 was informational. Now let's go back to number three. Number three has language change that is highlighted in page 98 of the combined packet. Good, okay. Um, do I need to go back to board comment and public comment on those first two informational items? Okay, so we're gonna hold on to the we're gonna hold on to the language change of number three. Sorry, folks. Um, is there any board comment on item 16A1 or 16A2? Both were informational items. Is there public comment on those items? Seeing none, we'll move to the language change for 16A3, Patient Privilege, Business and Professions Code 2918, and those are on page, those are highlighted on page 98 of the combined packet. All right, we're all on the same page? Cool. <laughs> I think I'm getting the Fridays. All right. Mr. Burke, do you want to review the changes in the language proposed. Yes, I do. I'll actually have um, asked Ms. Sorek to do that, but I, I did want to apologize. Um, some of these, this item was intended to be fully informational, and that isn't what it says in the uh, memo, so I apologize for that confusion. But uh, in, in this area, as you well know, things, things change and move, the conversations we've been having with stakeholders, and that's why these two items are now, are now um, action items. So I, I apologize for the confusion. For, that comes from the materials. And that's on us, so I Thank apologize you. for that. Um, Ms. Sorek, to discuss the changes. Um, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit, and I'll uh, 
also uh, look to Dr. Phillips to assist me on, on this one. Um, as part of uh, looking for an author for the language that the board approved back in May of 2021, um, we had some um, additional conversations with our child custody stakeholders, and there was a concern that the language um, really relied on a psychotherapist client relationship. Um, so part of our discussions with the child custody stakeholders was to ensure that the language addressed not just a relationship between a psychotherapist and their client, but if there was a forensic setting, for example, that uh, we were also including uh, those uh, situations as well. Um, additionally, you'll see uh, the word patient crossed out, um, and that was just more of a technical cleanup because the language that we've been using in our legislation has been client versus patient to be more uh, expansive on uh, stakeholders that the board serves. Um, so I just wanted to point that out and um, ask if Dr. Phillips had anything um, additional to kind of point out with the language and the materials. Um, I, yeah, just to clarify your comments, Ms. Sorek. Um, the psychotherapist patient privilege applies to psychotherapy. It doesn't apply, <coughs> excuse me, to a forensic setting. There's other laws and statutes and things that regulate that. Unfortunately, a lot of times when we're looking for documents in a where there's been a forensic evaluation, or we're looking for the underlying documents, the psychotherapist, or the psychologist in this case, um, still asserts the psychotherapist patient privilege. So then we have to go through the process of trying to then enforce a subpoena, which can, from what I understand, cost between fifteen and thirty thousand um, dollars. And sometimes the judges will find the psychotherapist patient privilege to apply, even though it doesn't apply, um, because judges don't always make the right decisions. God bless the judiciary, but um, so um, this is a way of cleaning things up and also to address some of the concerns from the child custody stakeholders in terms of the accessibility of materials related to complaints about child custody evaluations, which was really the genesis of this whole thing in the first place. So it's uh, been an interesting process to go through, but I think we've got things covered. The only thing I'm concerned about is um, the statute that we're doing, the statute cuts off at the end of page 99, but it's not all the text. Oh. And then it leaps into something else. So you're not looking at the complete text. And if we had the projector, we could bring the, t the text up, but the projector's not working. There's another line, and uh, there's a number three uh, that was on page three. I apologize that it somehow didn't get into the materials. We're just looking at the changes, correct? Or are we looking at the whole thing? We're just, We're just looking, looking at, at the changes. changes. I will tell you the only change on uh, that missing page is uh, patient to client. Oh, well, that's not very so. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so no harm, no foul. Um, it, it is that cut off, that item that's cut off is in the in the folder that has the individual um, agenda items, it's on number item number 16, page 11. And there's a, a line and a, sh and a short paragraph, and the only highlighted change, like um, Antoinette said, is from patient to client. For transparency, I just want to make sure everyone can see it. Was there any other board comment on this item? So on page 99, is it a number four that's highlighted that takes care of the forensic aspect, Dr. Phillips? 
Yes. Mr. Fu. Madam Chair, if it's helpful, would you like a motion to adopt the uh, approved language or the amended language as highlighted in yellow? I, I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fu. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and second by Dr. Phillips to adopt the, the language that is, um, the language change that is highlighted. Dr. Cervantes, real quickly, I think Ms. Marks may want to modify the motion I just made, given the microphone action over there. So I just yeah, want to I'm, confirm with her that that's in the appropriate motion. I'm sorry, I was just going to suggest, that because it's statutory, that you're approving the language to um, for uh, seeking statutory change, as opposed to adoption. Thank you. Um, so I would like to amend my motion that we are seeking, that we are um, approving the statutory changes um, as highlighted in yellow in uh, attachment or in agenda item 16A3. Second. With more enthusiasm, Dr. Phillips. <laughs> so it's been moved to approve the statutory uh, language uh, presented here for item 16A3. Um, it's been moved by Mr. Fu and second by Dr. Phillips. Was that clean enough, Noreen? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, just uh, before our vote, I just want to um, thank um, Dr. Phillips for his work on this and for distinguishing that uh, forensic aspect. That issue came up during my legislative meetings um, during the week, and I I didn't explain it as good as you, but it but it is very important to distinguish that that there is already a set of laws that regulate that component, and they they're not we're not um, we're not mixing them. We're letting them better interact for the purpose of cons of consumer protection, which is our goal here. So thank you, Dr. Phillips. Um, before we vote, we're going to open public comment. Yes. Okay. Hi, it's Dr. Elizabeth Winkleman at California Psychological Association. Um, thanks for the opportunity to comment, Dr. Tate. I actually probably have more than two minutes of comments. Either. I was wondering if I could have a little more time. Otherwise, I'll just talk really fast and just hit the high points. <laughs> Would four minutes suffice? Yes, I think four minutes. Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Okay, so um, I wanted to raise some concerns about this proposed exception to the psychotherapy patient privilege for your consideration. I understand that the board has previously approved this, um, but I am still hoping you'll continue to discuss it and perhaps reconsider your position. CPA does not have an official position yet. Um, the bill has not been reintroduced, and our board hasn't reviewed it, but they'll certainly be discussing all the concerns I'm going to mention today um, at their next meeting if this is introduced. Um, the, the drawbacks, the, the uh, main concerns here are potential drawbacks that were actually cited in a document when this was initially considered in 2020 in Board of Psychology meeting documents regarding the potential drawbacks of this, and I've been considering further what might happen if this goes through. Um, as, as you all know, that um, confidentiality is a cornerstone of psychotherapy, and maintaining confidentiality is a primary obligation under our ethics code. As described in the board's own documents in 2020, some of the potential drawbacks are a loss of patient confidence in the confidentiality of psychotherapy, um, creating an exception to the robust privacy protection of the psychotherapy patient privilege may cause patients or potential patients to lose confidence that their treatment or potential treatment will be kept confidential. The loss of patient trust in confidentiality of their psychotherapy may re result in the patient withholding from full participation in therapy or even declining to seek treatment altogether, thereby detrimentally impacting the psychotherapist patient privilege. I won't read through the entire uh, comments from the previous board documents, but it also talks about a potential detrimental impact on psychotherapist note-taking in terms of knowing that they could, uh, there's a greater chance of the notes being um, accessed by the Board of Psychology. 
and a potential chilling effect on a patient complainant who may want to make a complaint but may not want to reduce, re, may not want to reveal their full psychotherapy notes. Another, in addition to those drawbacks mentioned by the previous Board of Psychology doc, documents, I wanted to mention that the exception allows for a patient who has not brought a complaint um, for their records to be released without consent. And this could lead to some re very negative income. Um, outcomes. In other words, you might be protecting some patients, but you could be harming other patients by uh, gaining access and re uh, ha by uh, removing the privilege and confidentiality of their own records. For example, um, let's say a d domestic violence victim's husband could file a complaint about the wife's therapist, and then the um, the if the wife did not want her records to be introduced in any kind of hearing or proceeding or investigation, the board would still have access to those. The reason why a subpoena and a court order are needed in, right now is because that protects the patient and it gives the judge the opportunity to weigh the interests of either uh, pursuing the complaint and the hearing versus the privacy and confidentiality of the patient. That is the way that the system works. And there's no way for the board to completely assure the confidentiality of these records once they are accessed in the course of a proceeding or hearing. So I, would, I think it's important to keep in mind you can't fully protect the privacy after the records are accessed by the BOP, a board of sec, uh, by the board, and to keep in mind that there is already a process for when the judge determines it's necessary to access these records, even if it is expensive. Um, and I would also want to say, um, uh, that, uh, and in terms of the specific language, uh, you may also want to consider, if you're still considering this language, that the, it's in the evidentiary code, it is the psychotherapist patient privilege. So I don't know what the outcome is. The regulatory attorneys can decide if you, you know, if that's, uh, if that's a language change that would make sense. And also to point out that, again, there could be some very vulnerable patients who are involved in a court-ordered court or a court-related evaluation uh, such as somebody who's being assessed for competency, uh, for mental competency, somebody who's in a divorce proceeding and the other spouse wants to review, get their records accessed, a child whose records are relevant in some situation where maybe the child is a 17-year-old and doesn't want their records to be released. So, um, <clears throat> So anyway, I, I appreciate your op the opportunity to comment. I, oh, one final thing is no psychology, California Psychological Association was not a participant nor formally invited to the stakeholder meeting at the time that that was initially held when this was developed. And furthermore, I don't believe there were any child custody evaluators at that meeting. Uh, Ms. Ort can correct me if I'm wrong. So I, although you have previously approved it, for all the reasons that I mentioned, I'm hoping that you will have a further discussion of this proposed legislation and consider the Thank potential you. unintended consequences that might actually be harmful to some Thank patients. You. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Do we have board comment or staff comment? Ms. Dr. Phillips. Yes, I'd just like to respond to some of the comments that were Thank made, you. particularly about the California Psychological Association being invited to the stakeholders meeting. When we inquired of the president or the, excuse me, chief executive officer of the California Psychological Association at the time as to whether she wanted to attend the meeting, she said there wasn't of interest to her. So we didn't extend a formal invitation because she said she didn't want to come. So the fact that you were excluded from the stakeholder meeting, which I've been hearing for a couple of years now, is erroneous. And I think it's, it's unfair to the board. Um, as to the specific items that were discussed, that's a white paper that we created for purposes of looking at all sides of the issue before we made the determination to proceed with this. There are safeguards built in by the board as it relates to the confidentiality, excuse me, confidentiality of the documents that we receive. And um, the particular concern you had about abuse was addressed um, in the context of our discussions with the custody stakeholders. And they certainly felt that um, under those circumstances there were sufficient safeguards in place beyond um, the subpoena enforcement process that would allow us to keep those records from going to other people. As you know, we keep those records very confidential within our enforcement department. And whenever records are introduced in a public setting, typically identities or other 
other um, information can be redacted or completely excluded depending on the protective order provided by the administrative law judge. So I think these, these concerns have been addressed before. I appreciate um, uh, Dr. Winkleman bringing them to the attention of the board again, but I don't want to have to necessarily kind of have this conversation over again unless specific board members have questions in that regard. Thank you. Mr. Fu? I do have specific questions, but actually it's for um, Ms. Monterubio with regard to what the board has access to, and then if uh, Ms. Monterubio can indulge me in some of my questions, I would really appreciate it, because I think it's relevant. This is one of those unscripted moments where <laughs> she has no idea what I'm going to ask her. Hi. Ms. Monterubio, when, thank you for um, indulging my questions. When the board reviews any enforcement um, case and records are made available to us, um, with regard to those proceedings, it's my understanding that typically the Deputy Attorney General will request the Administrative Law Judge to redact um, files and also issue a protective order for those files. Is that correct? Yes. And with regard to any public versions of those files, those are, re are redacted and any information with regard to patient name or um, any medical information, that is also redacted for those public files. That is correct. And to your recollection, have you had any incidences where any private medical information during the course of enforcement proceedings have been released to the public? I am not. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Dr. Kasuga. Uh, while um, Ms. Monterubio is here, um, I am wondering if um, you'd indulge us with the backstory uh, with regards um, this particular um, stakeholder uh, conversations um, and the request for the, the, ch the statutory change. Well, we had a stakeholder meeting back in 2018, um, September, in fact, 2018. And this was one of the items that was brought to the attention of the board with several other um, requests as well. I think from that meeting, it was discovered that we, enforcement, have difficulty at times being able to thoroughly investigate a case. Um, as many of you know, we're entitled to a 730 evaluation. Um, in a child custody case, but that's not always enough information for our experts to determine whether or not the, um, there's been a departure from the standard of care. Many times they need additional information, um, notes, uh, test material, um, and that is because a lot of the complaints allege bias, and we might have the non-custodial parent state that they didn't get enough time with the evaluator like their soon-to-be ex-spouse. We want to take a look at those notes and determine whether or not that, in fact, is true. Um, did the non-custodial parent only get an hour or two versus the soon-to-be ex-spouse get 10-plus hours? Those are things that our experts need to be able to review and determine whether or not, again, there's been a departure from the standard of care. A 730 evaluation, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Phillips, is an in-depth analysis of the family and the family's relationship. So again, that may not be enough in these situations. Um, so most times we might have to close out a case in sufficient evidence because the non, or I'm sorry, the custodial parent is not going to sign the release for records. So then we are faced with having to do subpoena enforcement, which, as Dr. Phyllis mentioned earlier, is quite costly, and not only that, quite timely. That can take anywhere from six to 12 months, and even at the end of those 12 months, we may not get the records that we are looking for. So we'd have to close those cases in sufficient evidence. But I'd also like to go a step further, and if I can mention, once we get records in a board investigation, those are protected and confidential under Government Code 6254, subsection F, and Evidence Code 1040. When a case is sent over to the Attorney General's office, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, they can redact um, confidential information, they can use initials of the client, or even refer to them as patient one, patient two, or patient three. 
They also, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, can request a protective order to seal, which is then granted by the administrative law judge. But child custody are not the only cases that we deal with at the board where this is an issue. I'll give you an example. If we have a sexual misconduct case where someone has filed a complaint and then later might change their mind and not sign the release for records. They might change their mind for many reasons. The stress of a hearing, um, maybe the licensee reached out and would like to settle the matter outside of the board. We still want to investigate because that is one of the most egregious violations I think a licensee could commit. So we still want to get those records. We're gonna look at the frequency of the visits, what time were the visits. This is all important information for our experts to review and determine again whether there's been a departure. And as many of you know, if someone does engage in a sexual relationship with a client, we look to seek revocation. So we want to get those records so that we can investigate all of the complaints that are submitted to the board. Thank you so much. And just to, for clarification, um, who gets access to those records? Uh, board staff will look at those records and then we will send them over to our subject matter experts who are well aware that that information is confidential. Um, and then it's sent over the attorney general's office as well, Thank if we seek discipline. Thank you so much, Ms. Monterubio. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Any other board comment? We have um, a motion uh, to approve the statutory language uh, changes that were proposed. It's been moved and second. Can we call for a vote? Kasuga? Aye. Cervantes? Aye. Who? Aye. Harp Sheets? Aye. Nystrom? Phillips? Aye. Viscate? Aye. Rogers? Aye. Tate? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes. Are we good? Okay. We're going to move to item uh, 16A4. This is a California Psychological Association legislative proposal for 2023. It affects the Business and Professions Code 2914. This item is um, page 101. And Mr. Burke, do you want to? share some insight on this? Uh, absolutely, and again, uh, to apologize, this was an item that was purely informational because at the time it was merely a, a concept, a proposed change. However, um, since the materials were created, disseminated, a, a bill has been introduced which, which makes some of the changes in the CPA proposal. Um, those, propo those changes are essentially that um, upon completion of coursework, an applicant for licensure would be able to take um, any and all of our um, licensure examinations. Um, there's no formal uh, staff haven't got an analysis to share because the bill was only introduced um, a few days ago, I think. Um, it's AB 2234 and... This one was in the hand carry. Yes, yes, AB, 28, uh, AB 282, um, Assemblymember Aguiar Curry. Um, so it, it, it is now a bill um, which can be considered by, by the board. Um, CPA are obviously here, so I think they might want to come up and talk, talk more about their proposal, but that's what um, staff have at this time. Thank you. Um, what I, what I, I'm open to hearing um, other board members on this, but what I'd like to do is recommend that uh, we look at this at the Legisl Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Committee so that we can give staff an opportunity to analyze it and to think about, which is my, my concern, is the, uh, 
what it looks like operationally and what impact it might have um, on um, processing times and the types of things that um, we've been hearing from our stakeholders on. So I think that's a better, uh, or that's a good place to discuss it in more depth. But um, is there any board comment before we open to public comment? Do you need a motion to defer it back to the committee? Do we need a motion? I don't think you need a formal motion, but if you uh, want to make it more clear that that's the direction that the board would like to go, if not uh, discuss it currently, but send it back to committee, then you can delegate it back. Okay. I'd like to hear from other board members, and then we could decide if that's the path we'd like to take. I think something of this importance probably should go through our normal process in terms of looking at it in committee. Um, and thinking about it and bringing recommendations back to the board. I would have to agree with yeah. that. I would, oh, sorry. Mr. Fu? Uh, can I ask Mr. Burke some questions? Can I just say one thing first, too? I, I think that the committee needs to consider it in terms of what we're looking at with ECCC2. I think there's some relevance there, and that also um, affirms the need for some additional time and process. So. Thank you. Um, you wanted to ask a question to Mr. Burke. Go ahead, please. Sure. Uh, Mr. Burke, um, I just want to clarify, I have a few clarified questions with regard to this uh, item. Um, were you or any of the, were you um, made aware of any language with regard to the introduction of this bill? Prior to the introduction of this bill? We, we, we had received the letter, uh, the concept letter from, from CPA and the proposed language so we had we had seen it and there, there'd been discussions but we we hadn't formally analyzed the bill yet because of course there was no there was no bill um, and um in uh was the advice or um in the past typically there's been some sort of consultative role i, I believe on the psychological test technicians bill there was some technical advice that was provided um, was technical advice requested of the board? I, yeah, I'm, I wasn't. I wasn't privy to those discussions. Um, I know that there there are often uh, informal conversations to take place between the executive officer and the the staff of CPA. But I, I I wasn't involved in those conversations. But that is not to say that they did not happen. Um, I just want to. Um kind of draw our attention to a couple of uh, date items here. Um, our uh, Legislative and Regulatory Affairs uh, Committee is scheduled to meet April 7th. Our board meeting after that would be May 19th. And then looking at the legislative calendar that's on page uh, 103 of the combined packet, the last days for policy committees to hear on uh, bills that have a fiscal is uh, May 19th. So uh, assuming that the committee wouldn't um, look at this issue until uh, April and then the board wouldn't look at it until May 19th, the Business and Professions Committee will have probably already heard this and it would probably be on its way to Appropriations Committee. So if the while we haven't done a staff analysis, I think at least conceptually with the language that is in the uh, meeting packet, if the uh, board would like to weigh in, um, what typically will happen between now and the board meeting is committee staff will call the board and say, hey, are you guys good with this? Do you have problems with this? And if we say, well, we don't have a position and won't until May 19th, which Ms. Marks pointed out we could uh, schedule a special meeting and just discuss bills, which we can certainly do. Um, but I know you guys have busy personal uh, lives with real jobs um, on top of your real important work here. Um, so I just want to point those timelines out and, and maybe 
not taking a position per se, but if the board has thoughts on the policy and the language that gives staff the ability to have those conversations with the committee consultant staff um, when they call us. Um, we can say while we don't have an official position on the bill yet, we do, um, you know, the board did, you know, like this language or had an issue with this language. Those are conversations that um, I think with the language that's in the materials, it's more of a policy call for the board and less of a staff recommendation that would come out of an analysis because this is really a policy call that doesn't have so much of an impact on the workload of staff, operationally speaking, after. So we can pivot based on where your discussion is today. I just wanna throw that out. Um, and I, I'm looking to the CPA representatives in the audience, so I, I don't know if that's helpful as a little addition to the context of the, the bill and the timing. Dr. Phillips? I, I'd like to give this a little bit more time. I haven't had an opportunity to study this in depth or to think about the implications of it on a policy level. I also think there needs to be some consideration in the licensing committee about how this may impact the process of licensing. Um, so I would prefer that, and when does the licensing committee meet next? Why? Oh. Well, maybe you can give us informal advice before we have the legislative committee. But um, I'd prefer, frankly, as much of a pain in the neck as it is, and I know it's a pain in the neck because I've been through it several times, to have uh, a, a short WebEx meeting prior to the time BNP meets in order for us to be able to take an informed um, position on it. It shouldn't take that long if we restrict it down to this and perhaps a couple other pieces of as legislation. As a special meeting of the board? Yeah. I, I concur with that. I might suggest to the board that um, in the event that a, you can't convene a quorum for such a meeting, that you might consider a possible delegation to the committee to uh, state a tentative position of the board. So. Okay. Could you say that again? I'm sorry. I was considering the possibility that the, uh, the, the board might want to provide a delegation to the ledge committee to state a tentative position of the board in the event that you could not uh, get a quorum to have a special meeting after the ledge committee meets. Um, as I, I know that there have been times where you've intended to have a meeting and because of your very busy lives, as Ms. Sork mentioned, that it's, it's really difficult to get a quorum. So to have as a fallback position the possibility that the ledge committee could state a tentative position of the board. Thank you. Do we, could we have, um, I, don't, I don't mean to put Mary on the spot, yeah. but yeah. could we get a, a special meeting possibly of the licensure committee to also look at this, you know, in this time frame to give that type of recommendation that I think would be helpful, or, or what might be some avenues that we can get yeah, some of that insight. Yeah, I think that's important for us to do. <laughs> Short meetings that we can come up with. Yeah. I, I'm deferring to um, staff and to the chairs, if the chair of the licensure committee and its members are available on the day of the legislative committee meeting. I wonder if there's a, I think that almost constitutes the majority of the board at that point. And so uh, more than the majority of the board. And so if there's, from a scheduling perspective, the licensure committee is able to meet on the same day as the legislative committee meeting, I'm more than happy as a member of neither committee to delegate authority. Um, <laughs> To, to the wisdom of the chairs so that you have a tentative position in acknowledgement of the legislative calendar. So I, I'm not, I don't want to put folks' schedules on the spot, and so, uh -huh. but I throw that out as a suggestion, recognizing that um, both committees constitute the fount of wisdom that is the Board of Psychology. What, what is that date? Um, ours is on April, oh gosh, hold on, 
sorry, folks. Right. When is it? When are we meeting? April 7th. <laughs> it's on my calendar for sure. <laughs> I'm just not. Also, the IEEE ad hoc committee is meeting on the 28th. On the April. 28th of April? April. Yeah, it just seems like we have a lot of discussion points. Um, we need to kind of flesh this out. Um, I, I'm just saying as a member of neither committee, I'm happy to defer to your wisdom if it helps with the legislative calendar. That's just my perspective. I, I don't speak for the other members who aren't on those committees. I'm So if, if the will of the board is to, to run the full process, then that's fine as well and happy to be a part of that. I'm just deferring to um, our board president and to our, our chairs of our committees. I, what I'm thinking about is um, if we make a motion here to delegate to the legislative and the Regulatory and Legislative Affairs Committee, a, a tentative position, um, and then gain insight from the other two committees uh, by the May meeting. Mm -hmm. For the purposes of the legislative calendar and to give guidance to staff on the position. Uh, I'm just thinking about calendar-wise. I'm not sure, with all respect to the ECCP2 task force, that they need to be involved in this particular discussion because the EPPP2 is not a foregone conclusion at this point. And I, I would think even if we were going to adopt the EPPP2, that wouldn't really affect our discussion as to when somebody can take the licensing test. The, the EPPP um, uh, ad hoc committee is, um, is uh, looking at all the, the license, the uh, examinations, not just EPPP2. So Dr. Kasuga and Dr. Harpsheets are on the EPPP task force. I am confident that if, with the two of you on both committees, are able to come to the, to the Regulatory and Legislative Affairs Committee, that you can accelerate this timeline without necessarily the April 28th meeting. That, because you're both, you're, the three of us are on that ad hoc committee, but the two of you are actually on licensure and a legend reg as well. So Dr. Dr. Kasuga's on ledge. That's what, yeah. yes. She's on all three. Yes. <laughs> on two. No, she's on like, two. And Dr. Tate and, and Ms. Nystrom are on licensure. Oh. Right, so. But it, Dr. It, Harpsheets is on both the EPPP committee, adult committee, and license and licensure. And you're, on, yes. So there's like a Venn diagram here of. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to suggest, that we don't need to, that the, the April 28th, uh -oh. uh, Ms. Ork is about to throw <laughs> some cold water. Okay, here comes the wet blanket moment. Um, <laughs> I, I want to be very mindful of our staffing right now. Um, and I'm hearing a lot of meetings which are uh, time intensive for our staff. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to put up a little bit of a, a wall and uh, suggest another alternative, um, which is that we try and schedule our legislative committee earlier and then we try and schedule our board meeting earlier. Both are webcast. It gives us the ability to have discussions. We can share the analysis with all of the committee members on all of the committees so you guys can come to the board meeting um, well informed on what's going on. We can have it just be a legislation uh, covered board meeting um, by WebEx. Um, and that way we can have an impact earlier in the legislative process. I, I, I want to be uh, mindful of that. Um, and I want, uh, we have, I believe, a good working relationship with the California Psychological Association in uh, policy and having informative dialogue, uh, whether we agree or we don't. Um, so it's helpful to be able to have the ability to engage in those informed conversations, not just with the legislative staff, but with our stakeholders. So I'm throwing that out as an alternative um, to the other meeting that up dynamics. So well, um, how would you recommend then that the licensure committee convene to be able to provide input? earlier board meeting. 
I, I'm wondering if that without having a convening a, an extra committee meeting, if there is a way that the uh, discussion can be informed because the nothing happens without the board's full approval mm -hmm. as far as a position. Mm -hmm. Unless there's a delegation, as Ms. Marks mentioned, where you guys uh, as a board today, for example, say this is how we feel generally about this um, policy and then delegate authority to the legislative committee to convey that. Um, is that correct? Correct as a as a tentative, the as a tentative, tentative position, position until the board. the board meets and full you know takes a fully authorized board vote and and makes a, a decision on a position on the bill. Um, I, I would also like to caution the board to not set up a serial meeting by serial committee meetings. So I've lost track of Dr. Kasuga's Venn diagram and how many are in the center. <laughs> but if you have a quorum of the board at a meeting because you have committee members from one committee speaking to the committee members of another meeting, you have a board meeting. And it would have to be noticed as a board, which may not be a problem if you notice it as a board meeting, but I would they want to make sure that the board is not having serial committee meetings or, or failing to uh, notice a board meeting for what it is. And I believe we actually have language in the committee meeting agendas that says a quorum of the board may be present, but board members who are not members of the committee may not, uh, uh, I think they may not, they may say they may not speak or, um, you know, share their opinion, so. I think it's cleaner that way to have an early board meeting. Mm -hmm. it, I think Dr. Kasuga just said that it was cleaner to have an early board meeting or an earlier board meeting and possibly a committee meeting as well. And earlier, both meetings, both the... Yeah. I think... Did you have something else, Doctor? Oh, yeah. So if we have an earlier board meeting, is that when the licensure committee members would provide feedback during that board meeting? Yes. Hmm. As an alternative, could you have an earlier WebEx meeting of the licensing committee just for purposes of looking at the statute? That's what I'm wondering, but um, Ms. Marks, would that be considered part of a sort of a serial board meeting or a serial meeting? Uh, explain to me again what you're okay. considering. What I'm suggesting is licensing committee meet earlier for a very brief whoop. <laughs> Sorks looking at me like, oh, God. Um, <laughs> to just discuss this particular statute, which shouldn't take, I wouldn't think, like yeah. more than an hour, an hour and a half. Um, that we'll have an earlier meeting of legislative separate apart from ledge reg would meet separately earlier. And then we'd have an earlier board meeting to move on it. Um, that would keep those two processes, licensing committee and, and reg leg separate. And then we could all come together and talk about what the board wants to do. So you're, you're talking about uh, an additional board meeting for whatever number of ledge uh, items you may have. Is that it? I, I mean, I, I leave that up to staff as to whether they're yeah, going to move that's the whole what Ms. board Stewart meeting had forward. Suggested, okay. um, Legally, yes. Operationally, that's up to Ms. Sorek. Um, but as long as you're not doing sort of serial, coming up with a board decision through serial committee meetings by saying, well, we had this meeting and this meeting, so therefore this is the board's position. As long as you're not doing that, I think you're fine. So, but Ms. Sork, if we were to keep the scope of these committee meetings restricted and have the earlier board meeting, would you prefer to have the earlier board meeting as a full board meeting or just as the legislative stuff? So we would continue to have the May meeting and we would have an earlier board meeting to 
just discuss legislation. And, and if we needed to do enforcement, we could throw that on there to make the most best use of our time. But I think my question to Ms. Marks is, okay, so you have the licensure committee meet first and discuss this proposal. Then you have the legislative and regulatory affairs committee meet next. If the licensure committee input informs the legislative committee, isn't that the serial meeting that we're talking about and, and then you might as well have a board meeting? If, if yes, I think that it would be potential potentially a problem if you say this is what these other two board members said at this committee meeting you could have joint committee meetings you could have the two committees joint jointly meet with respect to this one and it's probably a, that would it may be again I don't remember the Venn document diagram there and how many board members are at issue there but if you have a quorum of the board you just notice as a board meeting you just don't have you'll have a quorum you just don't have all your members but you have the key members that you want Oh, and that's something. Yeah. I'm so confused. Now. So yeah. we'd have six members, totally three of each different committee, because I don't think there's crossover with licensure, right? We have Dr. Harbsheets, we have Ms. Nystrom, and Dr. Tate. And then on legislative and regulatory affairs, we have Dr. Kasuga, Dr. Phillips, and Dr. Cervante. So, so no crossover there. So we could have a joint committee meeting which would be a quorum of the board, but not all board members would be part of it. And then that joint committee could review this bill and then bring that recommendation to the full board meeting. Yeah, it, it is. It would be noticed as a board meeting because you have a quorum of the board to be present. But right. the idea is get your key players there. Mm -hmm. And then if, if anyone else uh, from the board happens to be in town, you can come. You'd be entitled to come. <laughs> it's already noticed as a board meeting. And then, ching, you know, check, check. Go ahead, Mr. Fu. So why don't we just have one board meeting with all of us to talk about this and just knock it out in one meeting? If you're going to have six members of two committees, the other three members, if they're free, can attend because it's a board meeting, shouldn't we just knock it out in one notice board meeting that's special? Well, that's look, quite, that's where we got to, isn't it? Well, I think we're one step stone away. But I think that would be Mr. really efficient, Mr. I, Fu. Now that I've joined the ranks of board staff, I totally get it and it's, we're good. We're all the same. A special board meeting will be, will be noted or cited um, at, in so, at some period in the spring for us to look at just this bill language. And then we'll take a position on it. I, I, and I'm just gonna throw this out. Um, since it, it would be a full board meeting, I would suggest that we talk about legislation since we don't have a lot of legislation. And, and maybe it's not the full scale because at the Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Committee, We'll be looking at outside legislation mm -hmm. as well to yes. take positions and bring recommendations to the board. But I think um, for purposes of our bills and if there's movement there and then this bill in particular because the board hasn't taken a position that we can have just the four proposals up for discussion. At the special board meeting. At the special board meeting, yeah. Okay. And, um, and we would do that before April, hopefully. Um, maybe we can do that sometime in March. Okay. Or very early April. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do what we need to do in order to make this happen, but um, I think it's a really efficient way of dealing with it um, yeah. and better to get it done. And that doesn't mean we're going to oppose or support, support the bill. We just need to figure out how it impacts um, the licensing process and uh, all of those things. So I think this sounds great. Okay. So um, do I hear a motion that we look at the these um, four proposals 
at a special board meeting that'll be uh, scheduled for the spring of 2023. So moved. Do we need a motion? Because the board president can just call a special meeting at her discretion with, based on our administrative manual. I'm happy to call a board meeting in the early spring of 2023. <laughs> Right. Well, it's because we were earlier talking about a motion to delegate. Yeah. I just wanted to. I don't think we need a motion. We don't need a motion? No, we're good? Okay. All right. Then we should open up public comment on this item. This. So is there any public comment for item 16A4, California Psychological Association Legislative Proposal for 2023? Welcome. Um, thank you yep. for your time today. I'm Jennifer Alley, the Director of Government Affairs for the for CPA. And, um, you know, we sent the letter in our language to you because we were hoping to, you know, gain your support today. But by no means did we want to <coughs> make you feel rushed in your ability to evaluate the bill. Um, we kind of, the genesis of the bill came from the survey that we conducted last year with our members that, you know, where they expressed some time delays in getting things processed. And so... Um, our hope was that this bill would kind of give a more clean line and, and uh, direction for them to be able to take their licensing exam. Um, so we welcome the discussion with you at the special board meeting, and I really appreciate your dialogue um, and your um, earnest on your due diligence when you review legislative proposals. We don't take your your position lightly, um, you know, in lobbying for this bill. I have been asked what your position is, and so um, because I'd been asked was kind of why I said Joe, can we send, you know, Miss our CEO, could we please send a letter and see if the board could hear it early? So again, I appreciate your thoughtful discussion and, and how you're going to review the bill, and, and we look forward to um, discussing it uh, moving forward with you in the early spring. So thank you again very much. Appreciate I, it. I have a quick question for sure. you. In your survey of your members, do you have any um, do you have any any data about um, not just I mean, the flexibility, I imagine, is is what they're responding to, yeah. but about maybe how how they feel about the the timing situation and what other things might be happening during that period as they're finishing their studies and taking the exam. Um, you don't. I'm not an expert in the survey, but. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Elizabeth Winkleman again from the California Psychological Association. So the survey, uh, Dr. Cervantes, was ab about the um, processing delays in the licensure process, mm -hmm. and this was the one that we discussed um, uh, at an earlier board meeting. So it was before we had developed this bill, and the response, of, the response was one of our thoughts of how can we, how could this be improved? Um, I'm glad to be able to take this opportunity to thank you for and the staff for how much the time delays of processing the licensure applications and various steps have improved. That is wonderful. Um, this bill would further streamline the process because right now what happens, there are a number of steps and at each step for like taking the CPLAE, taking the EPPP, registering as a psychological associate, applying for um, initial licensure, all of those steps each take, uh, previously it took like two to four months, now I think it's down to like six to eight weeks, it's much better. But this would um, streamline things by allowing people to just apply once when they finished all their academic coursework and then it would be up to them to when they are ready to take each part, each part of the, the EPPP, one, when the EPPP2 comes on, which is expected in 2026, when to take that and when to take the CPLEE. So all the requirements would remain mm -hmm. the same. Every, everybody who would be licensed would have exactly the same requirements as they do now, but it would just streamline the process of the application and the examinations process. Just a, a logistical piece is that if they apply to take it, they have one year to take it. So if they apply and they don't take it, they start again. 
just so adding that piece. Right. I think how it would work, and again, this is where the, I think we're going to really want the input of the staff and the licensure mm -hmm. committee. And by the way, uh, we did get some technical input it, it previously before, before introducing the bill. Um, I believe what would happen is there would need to be some type, an application to the Board of Psychology saying I finished all m with a, a note from the registrar, from the letter from the registrar of the school saying I completed all my academic coursework and the registrar attests to that. At that point, the applicant would be entitled to apply to get the EPPP. So they, that doesn't mean that they would take it right away. They might then register for the CPLAE or they might do this you know, EPPP later, they may register. So, so I think um, that would just be li leaving the timing discretion to the applicant. And I wanted to also take this opportunity to mention that this also, I think, is somewhat relevant to the workforce issues that were discussed in that excellent presentation this morning, in that we're looking for ways to get qualified people into the field more easily and streamlining things so it will be less um, burdensome and take a, a shorter period of time for those that are qualified and can pass, fulfill all the requirements and pass all the tests to get into the workforce. And part of what happened, what, part of what we found in the, uh, in the um, survey that we did was not only were there time delays, but this costs up people a lot of money and stress if their um, actual licensure is delayed by an extra several months or in, in previously it could be delayed up to a year approximately um, when you added all those different application waiting times together. So that's a lot of money for people who are already in debt and it's a lot of delay to getting into the workforce. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Go ahead, Dr. Phillips. I'm just curious. So you say complete all their academic coursework. That would not include their dissertation or doctoral project? Correct. And it wouldn't include their internship? Correct. So I guess what they'd be asking the registrar for, I've completed all my, because from a registrar's point of view, that's part of the academic work. <laughs> right. So we'd have to, we'd have right. to craft language pretty carefully. Actually, in terms of that. that has come up from our training community, and we're probably going to need to put clarifying language. So you're exactly right <laughs> about that. Um, but that is the intent, and it's also consistent with what um, part of what Dr. Horn was saying yesterday that people are in a best position to take the part one of the EPPP right after completing their coursework. And what she meant, I'm fairly sure, is the academic coursework, not, because some people can take, unfortunately, years after that point in time so to like complete possibly. their dissertation or do their, complete their internship. So this would actually be consistent with that aspect of what the ASPPB has said. And again, getting back to making it a little easier for people to get through this process and into the workforce. There are scenarios under which you could complete your coursework, take and pass all the exams, and then not get your hours in the appropriate amount of time, which would mean they've gone through a lot of extra steps that they might not feel like in retrospect is useful. But I mean, this. It's all this is um, again. This would be putting, giving the option. It's not forcing anybody to take an exam at any particular time. It's giving the individual applicant the opportunity to go through kind of a one, you know, to reduce the points of, uh, uh, to, to streamline and reduce the amount of time that you have to apply for, to get approval for something, and then giving them the flexibility to when in their own. Um, progress through the licensure process, does it make sense for them to take the exams? And I think I'm correct in saying that, um, at least I believe Board of Behavioral Science for master's level clinicians actually require that they take the ethics exam really early on in the process before they start seeing people. Oh, I didn't um, even hear. So it's, it's a different philosophy and it kind of, there's some appeal to that, but I won't yeah, further complicate the that's, situation. That's correct. It's my understanding they have to pass the ethics exam prior to completing their beginning their post degree hours. Right. And, and Dr. Phillips, if you have any language about that academic coursework piece, email it to me. Because <laughs> we're looking at some clarifying language. Late at Thank night you. should be getting an email about three o'clock in the morning or something. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any other public comment or board comment? Just seeing where we are on time, we're gonna close um, item 16A and then take take up 16c oh and then didn't we break. do 16c I'm yesterday sorry. b b oh, 16 okay 16b right.
did it yesterday. <laughs> so we're gonna go with 16B and then we'll take a break. Cool? All right. I'm getting us there, come on. Okay, so one more item, 16B, legislative items for future meeting. The board may discuss other items. Of we are on item 16B. This one is, it, we're going to open for future legislative items. Okay, so there's no report. There's no report on this item. Okay, so the board may discuss other items of legislation in sufficient detail to determine whether such items should be on the on a future board meeting, and or whether hold a special meeting, which we discussed previously, of the board to discuss such items pursuant to government code section eleven one twenty five point four. Um, as mentioned earlier, I just want to say the we have the legislative calendar is page 102 of the of the combined packet. Um, so if anybody has any items, uh, board members, for consideration at a future meeting, we'll take those now. Seeing none, is there any public comment on item 16B, like items for future? Um, Legislative items for future meetings. S seeing none, then uh, we're, cl we, we're finished with our discussion of items 16A, 16B, and 16C we discussed yesterday. So when we return from break, we'll do 16D. Absolutely, and we are breaking for lunch, and I will see everyone back here at 2 o'clock. Thank you.